Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's special Common Council meeting. There's a lot of public here. Welcome. Uh, public from out of town, I believe. There are representatives from over 20 fire departments uh, throughout the state here today. This is a very uh, controversial, very emotional issue. I ask that everyone please remain quiet while council is in session and uh, we will conduct our meeting uh, in, in a manner that will be orderly and respectful and courteous to the people who will make a presentation and conduct the people's business. Call a special meeting of the Common Council of Order. First item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Alderman Gisha, would you please lead us? <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alderman Gisha. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Boren, here. Bauk, here. Serta, here. Gisha, here. Hannah, here. Heidemann, here. Kittleson, here. Kleunis, here. Manny, here. Meyer, here. Montemayor, here. Rinfleisch, here. Ryan, here. Vanderweel, here. Verhasselt, here. and Wangaman. 16 present. Quorum is present. Attorney McLean, Mayor's appointments. <clears throat> Honorable members of the Common Council, I hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. David Lutzke to be appointed a city assessor commencing June 25, 2007 and expiring June 24, 2012. Signed by Mayor Juan Perez. And I will ask for a suspension, a motion to suspend. I'd make a motion to suspend. Is there any, no objection to that? If not, I'd ask for a motion to confirm. I'd make that motion to confirm. Second. Motion and second to confirm. Any discussion? Under discussion, I would just like the uh, council to know that uh, uh, Mr. Lutsky has agreed to accept the job that Marie Ellis used to, used to hold. He is a very qualified individual, high-spirited, articulate, all those ingredients that you want in the department head. He is also uh, an added plus to his application is, is the fact that he used to live in Sheboygan and wanted to come back to Sheboygan. Many of his family members are here. Um, the family uh, is crazy about coming back and, and being able to provide service to our citizens in this matter. So I, I thank you very much. We'll take the vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Confirmation is approved. I hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. Ronald Rinfleisch to be considered for appointment to the Civil Service Commission to fill the unexpired term of Lee Montemeyer, whose term expires 4-30-2010. Signed by the Mayor. I'd ask for a motion to suspend. Motion to second to suspend. Is there any objection? There being none, I'd ask for a motion to confirm the appointment. Your Honor, I'd make the motion to confirm. Second. Motion and second to confirm the appointment. There is a little bio in the back of your uh, handout about Mr. Rinfleisch, a very qualified individual. Alderman Rinfleisch, I believe you want to speak because he happens to be your dad. Yes, um, I will be abstaining from the vote. Thank you. You'll be uh, abstaining from the motion. Thank you very much, Alderman Rinfleisch. Uh, President Hanna. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on the school board with Mr. Rinfleisch for six years, uh, and truly you couldn't get a better candidate to serve the citizens. Thank you, President Hanna. And Mr. Rinfleisch was screened by the Celery and Greenances Committee, uh, proper channels. I believe the last time we weren't able to follow that, that's an error on our part. This time it was followed, and the Celery and Greenances Committee recommended uh, two individuals, and I selected Mr. Rinfleisch. Any discussion on that? There being none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Appointments confirmed. Thank you very much. Should record the abstention. <coughs> Pardon me? Should, uh, I'm sorry. Abstention. Please record aye. the abstention. Thank you. The next uh, item on the agenda is notice of intent to rescind the vote to deny Class B intoxicating liquor license for applicant number 2458, Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion to rescind the vote to deny the Class B intoxicating liquor license for applicant 2458. Second. Motion and second. Under discussion. Um, thank you, Your Honor. That is um, Florinda Perez with her Mr. Soul restaurant. And I do believe the intention of the council was to say yes 
to the liquor license. So we need this rescinding to go on to the next motion to grant the license. And under that discussion, the intention of the council was an eight tie vote. Mm -hmm. And I broke the tie and I cast the wrong vote. So I therefore respectfully request that uh, you reconsider this uh, under rescission and, and, and vote. Uh, we've discussed her issue before. We don't need to hash it in front of all the public anymore. At least I don't think so. This has been uh, discussed in the Law and Licensing Committee, and it's been discussed in the Common Council, too. We will take uh, discussion. Uh, Vice President Bourne. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, I just want to reiterate uh, what we discussed last week, that in the committee, uh, this was not even a close call. This was a 5-0 vote. Uh, I think there are some issues that if I could open up the floor to uh, uh, Assistant Attorney Adams, City Attorney Adams, and uh, Lieutenant David Sheffhauser, who's our advisor from the police department, I think they have some important input. So I would like to move to open up the floor to those two individuals. There, there's a motion and a second. Under discussion. Again, this issue has been hashed out by the, the committee already. Is there another discussion? Alderman Rinkfleisch. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, under discussion, I... I I, I question having served in council for two years and never seeing this before, um, what the, the city statutes say in terms of this process. Um, is, it, is it a new resolution that needs to roll over, or, or do you need to ask for suspension, or what? I'm, I'm directing this towards uh, city, city attorney. Attorney McLean. McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this motion is to rescind the prior vote to deny the license. As you recall from the last meeting, it was 8 to 8. The mayor broke the tie. His comments prior to the vote indicated it was leaning towards approval of the license, but the, uh, the vote was in the negative. It was to uh, deny the license, and uh, thinking it was voting in favor of granting the license, it voted uh, yes. Uh, that's my assumption. Uh, this is according to Robert's Rules of Order, appropriate to, to make a motion to rescind. You can't reconsider uh, only, you can make a motion to re reconsider only at the, uh, the meeting that you take the action on, but it is appropriate under Robert's Rules to uh, uh, act on rescission. The only caveat to that is that uh, you can't rescind something that's un undoable, if you will. If you enter into a contract with someone, they start performing, and you can't then go back and say, well, I changed my mind. I'm not going to contract with you. That you're, you're bound to honor. Here, uh, the denial of the license wouldn't be something that would be binding, uh, that would impact the future. So you could rescind this action if you so chose. Thank you. Chairman McLean. Uh, oh, Alderman Montemayor, did you comment? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. I wanted to... Um, Remind the council that on this is March just a motion. Excuse me. This is just okay. a motion to open up the floor. We don't. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is there yep. just a motion to open up the floor to expand the discussion? Otherwise, we will call the vote on it. Under discussion to open up the floor, Alderman Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't see any uh, merit in opening up the floor to again uh, uh, basically grill this individual in public. Uh, I believe that what happened is there was a tie vote on the council floor, and Mr. Mayor, you basically uh, tossed the wrong vote. You thought you were voting yes, and you voted no, or vice versa. And uh, therefore, I don't see any merit to, again, uh, grilling Ms. Perez. Uh, I believe that if it is the mayor's uh, wish to uh, just retake the vote. I think that's the way it should be done. Thank, Thank you, you. Owen Ryan, and I would agree with you. This issue has been discussed. She has been subjected to some very unpleasant occurrences in her life mm -hmm. and her business. Uh, we all make mistakes. Uh, we'll call the roll if no one asks any discussion on just the question of whether to open up the floor. Please call the roll. Bulk? No. Serta? No. Gisha? No. Hannah? No. Heidemann? No. Kittleson? No. Clayunas? No. Manny? No. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? No. Vanderweel? No. Verhasselt? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. And Boren? Aye. Four eyes, 12 noes. Motion fails on the motion to rescind. Please call the roll. Oh, under discussion, Alderman Clayunas. Thank you. 
Can we please restate the resolution? So we have the, I mean, uh, the, restate the vote so that we know what we're voting for. Um, and the I vote will be to rescind, to yes. re-vote it, and a nay vote, no vote will be not to rescind. It'll stay as it was before. Okay, thank you. Everybody got that? Alderman, refresh. I, I think I just missed that. I'm sorry. To clarify, uh, right now we're voting simply to rescind and re-vote. No, yes. yes. One thing at a time, though. <laughs> Let's, all you're doing right now is voting to rescind the previous council action. After this, okay. should it so be a favorable not... passage, an motion can come in from the floor to so grant the possibly license. two votes. Yes. We're voting to rescind, and then if that passes, we're voting to which way we're going to vote. Yes. Truly. Okay. Yes. Yes, Alderman. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Alderman Wangeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think this is highly unusual. I've never seen this happen before in my experience. Uh, I hope we're not setting a precedent here. I do believe uh, Madam City Clerk explained the vote before we took it. And if people misvoted, I, I really don't see that this should be done again. I mean, do we just keep voting until we get an answer that we like? No, quite frankly, we don't. I actually am in favor of rescinding because, as I just explained, and I will explain again, I voted the wrong way. Uh, quite frankly, what occurred that night was uh, uh, rattled me a little bit. I sort of got distracted a little bit. Um, your your uh, prerogative, Alderman Wagaman, is to vote against it. There being no further action, no questions, please call the roll. Serta? No. Gisha? Do you need to reiterate what we're voting on? We are voting yes would be to rescind the vote. A no vote would be not to rescind the vote. Yes. Hannah? Yes. Heidemann? No. Kittleson? Yes. Clayunis? No. Nanny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? No. Excuse me? No. Ryan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? No. Wangaman? No. Boren? No. Balk? Aye. Nine ayes, seven noes. Motion carries. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. I make the motion to grant the license to this to um, applicant 2458. Second. Motion and second. Under discussion. There being none, please call the roll. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? No. Kleunis? No. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? No. Ryan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? No. Wangaman? No. Boren? No. Bauk? Aye. Serta? No. Nine ayes, seven noes. Motion carries. Matters laid over, 4103 RC number 350708 by the Committee of the Whole, to whom was referred resolution number 130708 by Alder Person Rinsplash, authorizing the City of Sheboygan Fire Department to provide ambulance service to its citizens beginning January 1st, 2008. President Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would make a motion to accept and adopt RC number 350708. And, and put the resolution. And put the resolution upon its passage. There's a motion, motion and second. Under discussion, we will have a presentation by Orange Cross, uh, Orange Cross representative, and then followed by a presentation by the Sheboygan Fire Department. After that, we will uh, ask the alderman to uh, to engage in debate. During these presentations, uh, I will leave it up to the presenter if they want to be, inter not interrupted, but if they want to be asked questions while they present or would they have you rather wait. It will be their discretion, not mine. But as I said again, reiter to rephrase, I mean to say it again, presentation by our cross, presentation by the fire department, and then discussion. Okay, everybody okay? Orange Cross, Mr. Repre uh, representative. And do I need to push this now? Uh, I've got you on. Yes, hit it on. Test it. Testing one, two. You got it. Yeah. Good. You on? No. Okay, turn it off again, please. Okay, now turn it on. 
Okay, you should be on. Testing. Mayor, Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm going to give a brief PowerPoint presentation followed by Gene Hansen, our training officer, and then Dr. Suzanne Martin is going to follow up. So if we could uh, start with the PowerPoint. Could we uh, have the lights, please, Jay? As a state, this speaks for itself. We've been in, in business since 1979, and I think it speaks for itself. It's your constituents that has kept us in business, and we really appreciate that. History, some of this may be redundant for you. However, I'll go over it for some of the new people in the audience. We've been in business since 79. We're co-owned by St. Nicholas Hospital and Memorial Hospital. The city of Sheboygan elected to get out of the ambulance business in 1989 because of the tremendous amount of training and cost required to upgrade from the basic EMT level to the paramedic level. As a result, Orange Cross began paramedic level care to the city. Shared services, the relationship between Orange Cross and the city and county of Sheboygan is an excellent model, we believe, of how government and private enterprise should be run. Orange Cross is fiscally responsible and own, owns all of its equipment. There are no subsidies paid to Orange Cross by the city, county, or its owners. Duplication of services. The limited area and population we currently serve is too small to support another provider unless revenues increase dramatically, either through increased volume or excessive rate structure. Neither one of these prospects is beneficial to the community. Police, fire, and EMS. Obviously, Orange Cross represents EMS. The medical service provided by Orange Cross enables police and fire departments the ability to concentrate on protecting the community from fires and public protection without jeopardizing one or the other. You've heard this cliche many a time. If it's not broke, don't fix it. However, I believe it fits here. Your intentions of getting into the ambulance business will fragment an effective and efficient EMS system that is currently in place. Cost associated with EMS. The next two PowerPoints I'll briefly go over. We do believe some of these costs have been put in a proposal by the city. However, not all the costs have been accounted for. Medical direction is one that we feel that, or we haven't seen at this point from the city, um, and that we believe should be addressed. Uh, Dr. Martins, do you have anything to add to that as far as cost? Okay, that's all right. I'll continue on, and she can address that um, later. Uh, the health care facilities interface, that's where, again, being co-owned by two hospitals, we're part of the health care system, we believe is an excellent model for the, the city of Sheboygan and the surrounding communities. QA, Gene will address that. Documentation and recovery, uh, obviously billing collection is a huge portion of this. Personnel, 
municipalities pay higher wages to personnel that are in dual role function. Therefore, taxpayers are required to compensate for these higher wages. Orange Cross operates on a fee for service basis and is completely self funded. Again, neither our owners, city or county taxpayers financially subsidize our service. Liability risk management. City employees suffering work comp injuries. In the Sheboygan Press, June 16th of 2005, the city of Sheboygan is faced with numerous on-the-job injuries costing the city hundreds of thousands of dollars, as reported by Ed Surick, City Human Resources Director. Getting into the ambulance will certainly compound this. We did hear at a presentation that liability will not increase. It will increase twofold, or a hundredfold, I should say. What the skills are being performed as first responders is different than the paramedic level. Also, as far as lifting patients, you'll be lifting every patient, not just assisting with patients. You'll be lifting every patient. Wisconsin EMS statistics. And this is out of the website of Wisconsin EMS. While there's a common belief that the local fire department also provides ambulance services, in Wisconsin, 40% of 911 responding ambulance services come from the fire department, while 60% are separate and apart from the fire department. Fire department ambulance vehicles transport approximately 45% of patients each year, while 55% are transported by non-fire-based ambulance providers. When taking into account all ambulance services, including interfacility, hospital to hospital, special event, and intercept services, 68% of the patients are non-fire based and 32% are provided by the fire department. We hear control of the ambulance service. You have control of the ambulance service. There is a written contract with the city and county with a coalition ambulance quality assurance committee four representatives of the city and two from the county. They meet on a quarterly basis to oversee Orange Cross response times and quality of care. Consider taking the rush out of a potentially lethal decision to have an independent consultant or a group of non-biased representatives to review the ambulance issue at a subcommittee level. This was also brought up last Friday at a city county shared services committee in which they voted favorably for this. I would highly recommend we do this. Consider how will you fill the void of 42 emergency medical service personnel that Orange Cross has that provide pre-hospital health care in the city. Remember September 11, 2001, I-43 accident, the Borden chemical incident, the landmark fire, Consider dedicated ambulances, we hear. Orange Cross response times speak for themselves. Orange Cross utilizes peak time staffing to handle multiple ambulance requests. The priority of the response is not dictated by geographical boundaries. Consider the efficiencies of an existing city-county system that utilizes highly trained paramedics including training that exceeds the standards set forth by the state of Wisconsin. This will be eliminated if you decide to take over the ambulance service in the city of Sheboygan. Thank you. My name is Jean Hansen. I'm the QA training officer for Orange Cross Ambulance. In an effort to speak to the quality of care that Orange Cross provides our patients, we've prepared the documents you have before you, the, the orange paper documents. The first page lists many of the additional skills. Pull the whole thing, pull the whole thing up. There you go. The first page lists uh, many of the, uh, the additional skills and equipment that Orange Cross has chosen to provide. Um, those skills and equipment go beyond what a minimally trained paramedic service does provide. So 
It's an extra above and beyond that we've offered uh, the citizens of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. Brief overview of some of the things you're seeing in front of you. The first item, the continuous um, positive airway pressure device, is offered to uh, our patients who have significant respiratory distress. Um, it's a device that we can put on them, monitor them, and uh, provide a little extra care on the way to the hospital as well. Um, the critical care transports that we offer as well from the hospital to outlying hospitals for specialized services that they may not be able to get in Sheboygan County. Um, we do have several critical care paramedics who've gone above and beyond a normal paramedic level and have attained an 80-hour um, class to provide that service as well. So with that, then, the following two things, the maintenance of the, spe the specific medicated IV fluids and the thrombolytic therapy monitoring goes along with that as well. So we'll take those from the hospital to the outlying areas uh, for specialty care that we're not able to offer in Sheboygan County. We have purchased also a ventilator, portable ventilator. Um, instead of manually bagging the patient, um, as was done in the past, for a minimally trained paramedic to do, we've gone above and beyond with that training as well and purchased a, a $4,000 ventilator that we're able to provide, again, to the outlying uh, facilities from hospital to hospital if the patient were in need, were in need of that as well. Um, we are involved in a, in a STEMI project, an ST elevation MI, um, significant heart attack, positive signs of that. We recognize the need to get there quicker, uh, to get to the hospital quicker, and to get to outlying hospitals quicker as well. So we have spent considerable time, effort, and money um, training our, our paramedics to a higher level than a minimally trained paramedic would be as well um, in, in those capabilities. Um, page two then um, speaks to the quality of care that we believe is so important as well. Um, if you look at page two, you can appreciate the additional specialty training that we do provide above and beyond page one. Um, this is all specialty care things that you'll see that we offer our paramedics, and it is in addition to a minimally trained paramedic. Um, we believe that by allowing a minimally trained paramedic service to step into the contract, you're effectively telling the citizens of Sheboygan their quality of care is not as important as it should be. Are there any questions about the document we've given you? Any questions, Alderman? Vice President Bourne. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> you mentioned these additional trainings that's offered. Are these uh, offered, are they, are they required? They're not required, but the majority of Orange Cross personnel does take advantage of it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Let me find you here. Alderman Manning. Thank you very much. <clears throat> The uh, cost of your medical director, what does that total, where is that included in your, in your statistics before us? The old document her. from a week or two ago. I'll let her speak for herself. Thank you. I will ask the alderman to follow the protocol of the regular council meetings. Arise when you speak and address. Thank you. Would you please tell us your name too, please? Uh, Suzanne Martins. Um, thank you for allowing me the time to speak with you again. Um, as most of you know, I am the medical director for Orange Cross Ambulance. I'm also the medical director for about 90% of the EMS agencies uh, in the county. And I'd like to go back again and tell you how I got to this position, because my training is indeed unique. Um, I am a residency-trained, board-certified emergency physician. I trained at Freighter Hospital. That's a level one facility, a uh, level one trauma facility. Um, I also extended my uh, baseline emergency medicine training to a fellowship level in EMS, and that's relatively unique uh, throughout the nation, which meant I spent another year of graduate school uh, being paid resident wages um, pursuing specialty care in emergency medical services. Above and beyond that, I've also recently just completed my master's in public health administration. Some uh, fellowships do incorporate that in. Mine did not, so therefore I thought that I needed to pursue extra education. On top of my training as a physician, I also happen to be a state-certified EMT, and I have been so at, for the past 20 years. Based on my combination of education and field experience, arguably I'm one of the most, if not the most, uh, qualified medical directors in the state. The other person who is similarly qualified was my mentor in Milwaukee, that's Dr. Perillo. And I believe the question was my compensation. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, my compensation is uh, from different places. 
as part of my appointment to the staff at St. Nicholas Hospital, I am considered the EMS liaison, so therefore some of my salary is um, stipended. Separate from that, I have um, a contract with Orange Cross independently to dedicate uh, hourly, uh, sole hours to uh, their concerns, and that is compensated at a rate of $1,000 a month. Any other questions? Alderman Verhessel. Thank you, Your Honor. I guess uh, either Dr. Martin or, or Jerry, if you could just expand on your training expenses in general across the Orange Cross system, what they are annually. Okay. We do have some unique training opportunities. Jerry may need to bring up the numbers because I don't have all of them. Um, our critical care training is uh, uniquely tailored to this area. What we do is work with the hospitals to define the critical care skills, medications, and equipment that are necessary. And I know over the past five years, we've enacted, what, 10 new um, medications that are used solely for critical care. Um, the cardiac monitoring, the capnography monitoring, the um, ventilator are just examples of that. Jerry, do you have any numbers on our training, our education? I don't have specific numbers, the, the amount we spend for training education. However, the total salary of Gene is included in on that, along with all the numbers that you see on that orange sheet. So I don't have a specific number that we're spending on training education. I can certainly get that number for you. Thank you. Uh, we, have we do provide um, ongoing critical care training, which I do at our um, bi-monthly meetings. Alderman Bout. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Doctor, uh, Mr. Isbell used the word lethal in his uh, show, uh, show to talk about how grave the decision we were making tonight would be. In, in your professional opinion, do you have any reason to doubt the quality of care that Sheboygan Fire Department would be providing? Is there any reason why the city should be scared about a lethal decision being made tonight? I'm also the medical oversight for the training programs at Lakeshore uh, Technical College, so I do train paramedics. I do initial training, ongoing training, critical care training, and then we do supplemental training, such as the ones listed there. The difference between being trained, which my own um, primary instructor at LTC will acknowledge that once you come out of paramedic school, you are considered minimally competent. After that, you need to advance your skills, hone your skills, and learn more. So when you come out, it's expected that you can perform paramedic level skills. You are not expected to perform them um, at optimal uh, levels, and you still have lots and lots of education to do. Um, in emergency medicine in general, the learning curve is considered to be somewhere between five and 10 years of experience before you're considered exceptionally competent. Based on the turnover that I understand Orange Cross has, do many of your paramedics have that five to ten years of experience? What percent would you say has? Let's see. Who's got more than five years? Two-thirds? Take the... There's probably at least two-thirds that have experience at least five years. However, the turnover rate does include people that come to our organization with experience. In fact, we had one we hired two weeks ago has 20 years experience. So although new to the area, they come with experience. Okay. Thank you. Alderman is that okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Alderman Kittleson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess my question is then you do all of your training at LTC, most of your training there? No? No. Orange Cross does their training in-house. They do their training in-house, mm -hmm. but there is training at LTC. Training at LTC is ongoing. It's, uh, I mean, we have general EMS classes going at all times as well as supplemental classes. So we do first responder, basic, um, ITAC, and we've done an intermediate class, paramedic class, and then we do all the refreshers. So fire department personnel are able to go to LTC and, and get their training? Correct. Um, Typically, the fire department does do its own in-house training also. Okay. Though. So they I mean, do their... It saves on costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alma Kittleson. Any other questions? Alderman Manny. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, what amount of uh, worker injury, um, what's the track record at Orange Cross in workers' comp, et cetera? Jerry? 
again, I can get you the specific numbers off the OSHA 300 log that we keep track of. Uh, last year we had six injuries, uh, two back injuries, and the other ones I'm not sure of off the top of my head. Again, I can provide you with them specific numbers over the past three years if you'd like. Thank you. Alderman Clay Yunus. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, you said that when a paramedic is uh, trained, leaves the LTC program, or they're minimally trained, or minim minimally qualified, I should say. Minimally competent Competence, is our, is our key catchword. Minimum, minimally competent. Mm -hmm. How do they become competent? Is it a lot of on-the-job experience, uh, practice? In other words, the more calls they go on, the more competent they become? Yes, it's a combination of ongoing continuing education training, which is classroom, and now we're moving more to like web-based training. But you have to have hands-on experience to be able to apply because everyone knows that doing CPR on a mannequin is much different than doing CPR on your neighbor. Okay. President Hanna? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a question. According to the Journal of, of EMR, uh, private not-for-profit ambulance services have one of the highest turnover rates in the nation at 18 percent. Uh, fire department ambulance services have one of the lowest turnover. Can you comment as to why? Sure. That's a trend nationwide because the fire department has a much better um, ingrained system of providing uh, career and pension. Mm -hmm. What we do in uh, private EMS is many people are um, working their way through the business. There is a higher rate of turnover. We do have to dedicate more time on uh, orientation and training, but I would also uh, give one caveat. When I graduated from my MPH degree two weeks ago, one of my classmates, or graduation mates, whatever you'd like to call him, was graduating from medical school who happened to be one of our paramedics. That's some place that um, our turnover goes to. Any other questions? Okay. President Hannon, follow up. Thank you. It's a follow up. Thank you very much. It's my understanding from Orange Cross. Over the last eight to ten years, 27 of your paramedics have left to go to fire departments. Is that true? I don't have the exact statistics, but if those were the numbers that you were given, then that's probably correct. And I've been thanked, actually, by many fire chiefs and training officers for the quality of paramedics Absolutely. we provide to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Bout? And this question may be for Mr. Isbell. Uh, it, it has to do with, based on the reaction I get from many constituents, uh, the belief in the city is that the Orange Cross was sort of blindsided by this proposal three or four weeks ago. And it's my impression that Orange Cross had been working in concert with uh, the Sheboygan Fire Department on a proposal where Orange Cross would be dissolved and this responsibility would transfer to the fire department, that that was an ongoing discussion. And then about a month ago, that discussion stopped. And what I'm asking is to understand if that's true, why did that discussion stop about a month ago? <coughs> Excuse me. I was not part of them discussion. The board of directors of Orange Cross, which consists of three administrators from each hospital, were part of that discussion. They were investigating the whole possibility of the ambulance service. In fact, they visited Mantuak Fire Department to look into other ambulance services and see if they have the good model in this area. However, there was a letter January of 06 that was sent to the city and county for uh, an extension, so this um, has been a long going. Um, process but as the last <clears throat> excuse me two or uh, three or four weeks it's come to surface quite rapidly so no one can speak as to what was going on in the board's mind and why that that opportunity was looked at as is, is not something they wanted to pursue uh, they want to investigate it with an open eye they wanted to make sure that what we have in this area is a good model for EMS and they found that out okay Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. I think this question probably is for Mr. Isbell. If the city decides to go ahead with providing ambulance service to the city of Sheboygan, what are the plans for Orange Cross for the areas outside of Sheboygan? If the city decides to get into the ambulance business, the board will have to reconvene and take approximately 30 days to look into it and get back to you. At this point, we're not sure, so the board has uh, directed me to tell you 30 days at least to look into the issue. Any other questions? Alderman Serta. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Um, given your slide presentation, there was a mention of 42 personnel that wouldn't be able to service the city of Sheboygan. Could you tell us how many people are designated right now covering specifically the city of Sheboygan in terms of staff ratio right now? We have no geographical <laughs> limits, so we have 42 employees. And that's what I was referring to. Orange Cross has 42 employees. So if the city got into the ambulance business, there's a potential that them 42 would be out of EMS, and that's where the void would be created. Thank you. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, you have 42 employees, and how often do you have to use call-in staff? Um, I've heard overtime brought up, and how often do you have to utilize overtime? Numerous times. In fact, we use peak time staffing during the weekdays. Well, we may have six ambulances staffed. Besides that, everybody's issued a pager. We have what we call a, four, a code four or five, and if we need additional staffing, for instance, the I-43 fog incident, we call in the entire staff for that. So we have everybody that's not only working but off-duty personnel with pagers available. Including me. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't want to blindside you. I, I don't know if you have a copy, I don't want to be unfair with this, of an email sent by Dan Bonk from Aurora. Are you able to comment on that? If I were to ask a question, I don't want to ask you something you were unprepared to answer. I have no idea what, what email you're referring to regarding Mr. Dan Bonk. Okay. Um, Dan Bonk, and, and I won't press you on it, just maybe ask for your impression. Uh, Dan Bonk is the Executive Vice President for the Central Region of Aurora Healthcare and has been so for the last three and a half years. Um, he details meetings uh, going back with Chief Zire many years ago and then Chief Lestusky currently. And I know this is a little unfair and I apologize in advance, but he writes, and he is, of course, 50% owner of your company. His company is 50% owner of you guys. And I only ask this because it's a little, there's a couple of disturbing points internally in this. And he writes, um, I met with Chief Zyre several years ago. I have also met with Chief Lestusky. At this meeting and in subsequent meetings with Chief Lestusky, I emphasize that operating an ambulance service is not, in my opinion, a core service of a hospital or health system. Um, he goes on to write, uh, to this end, I have no reason to believe that the Sheboygan Fire Department cannot provide a quality paramedic and ambulance service to the residents of Sheboygan. And this is your 50% owner. Um, and people can misinterpret things and interpret things in different ways, and I think that's fair. But, and if you can help me here, I get a little concerned when a 50% owner of a company writes that kind of stuff. And, and giving you the benefit of the doubt that this was interpreted poorly on, on my part or in his writing, um, can you speak to the long-term viability or interest of the partners of Orange Cross? I certainly can't speak on uh, Mr. Bonk's email. I'd have to defer that to him. Thank you. I will comment, though, my last dealing with Mr. Bonk was the dissolution of Valley View Hospital in Plymouth. He, he was the administrator in charge of that decision. Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Your Honor. We have uh, two, two things that I'm concerned about in our proposal that I just want to be very comfortable with before we vote tonight is on the, uh, the rate increases that we have figured in our proposal. We figure about a 9.2% rate increase each year. And then the other thing is the call volume projections, which we have a 3% increase built in every year. Both of those add to a very good bottom line, and I just want to be comfortable that those numbers are solid. Could you speak to your experience in history? First of all, the, the call volume. <clears throat> Orange Cross does budget for a 3% increase in call volume. However, we're not guaranteed that. Two years ago, we went down 6%. So that is not a constant increase in volume. You can't count for that every year, a 3% volume. Okay, that's just a projection on, on, as far as budgeting goes. I believe the other point was 9.2% rate increase. Um, I don't know how they come up with that projection. However, what we typically do is go by the medical CPI. And we like to hold it to that. That's why the last three or four years you're looking at anywhere from 5% to, I believe, 3 and a half. Does that answer that? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Alderman Serta. 
Thank you, Your Honor. In all fairness to LB, I'm asking this question to the fire department. Given all of the bullets that you've highlighted on this form, is there anything in terms of your specialty, your education, that you feel that the Sheboygan Fire Department would not be able to duplicate? Absolutely. Our critical care and our QA project, because we dedicate hours and hours of that. Just to follow up, could you elaborate a little bit in fur um, further just so they would know um, what that actually means? Um, critical care is the uh, skills training medication that we provide above the paramedic level that, like I said, we have developed in conjunction with our <coughs> facilities and the needs of our citizens over the past five years. Mm -hmm. Our proposals have been immediately um, approved by the state because I work with people in the state um, office on a regular basis, and they're very aware of the quality of training that we provide here. We get immediate feedback from both the emergency department and ICU staff, and that has been our um, driving force for enhancing our education. Years ago, when um, critical care patients were transferred, their nurse went with them. Because of the nursing staffing shortage, that no longer happens. So essentially, when someone needs to go to a different facility, they can come out of an ICU, get put in the back of an ambulance for an hour and a half with no previous contact by that ambulance crew, and um, we are tasked with maintaining the level of ICU care during that uh, interfacility transfer. So we have taken over essentially the job of an ICU nurse. As for our um, QA project, we have very active QA. Um, I myself personally uh, screen about one third of our calls. All of our chest pains, pediatrics, traumas, respiratory distress, codes, refusals, interfacility cares, and any other weird calls that show up get pushed across my desk. Doctor, I have a question for you. The, uh, Dr. Koulis has indicated that he would be uh, willing and able to serve as, uh, as uh, medical director. Uh, is there any question in your mind that he is not capable of doing that? Not so much his capability, um, his time commitment. My recent experience with an, uh, upgrading the Plymouth system from an iTech um, organization to the paramedic level, I went back and checked my non-clinical hours, and I spent 20 to 30 hours per month for over a year solely dedicated to their upgrades and enhancements, training, ops plans, and uh, interactions with the state. My, um, I particularly work at a reduced clinical rate in the emergency department because I put in up to 100 hours a month as an EMS medical director. So you feel he's capable, but, not may, but may not be able to handle the time commitment. That's for him to decide, though. That's Correct. And also, I mean, he's, uh, he is instrumental in our cardiac programs. Mm -hmm. He would have to become familiar with all the other specialty care that we provide, including pediatrics, geriatrics, trauma, and um, other uh, interfacility transfers. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Wait, thank you. We have one more. Oh, Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. Please, please hold on. Please Dr. Hold on. Martins, one more question, Sorry. please. Yes. Okay. Um, in the quality of care, there yes. are a lot of technical expertise categories here, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, my question relates to in 9-11 response. If Sheboygan Fire Department had 9-11 response, how many of these would they need to be able to provide for that immediate care that doesn't include the critical transports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that would probably be an ongoing Orange Cross uh, responsibility. Which subsection are you looking at? Looking at all the categories. What, what, what does the Sheboygan Fire Department oh, have Oh, what would to they require to, to, to yeah. provide um, 911 emergency care? Yeah. Um, the uh, Continuous positive airway pressure device is now accepted as standard airway management down to the basic level. Uh, interosseous, which is um, a needle placed in the bone for critical care patients, is now recommended by the American Heart Association as the second line if you're unable to establish an IV. <coughs> um, the rest is inner facility. The STEMI project, which is the acute MI project, um, the ability to obtain, interpret, and transmit 12 lead EKGs immediately, as well as possibly having to transport the patient out of the county immediately is part of that project. The 12 lead capabilities are underneath that. Um, end tidal capnography, which is exhaled CO2. It's considered um, one of now becoming a standard of care for intubated patients. Uh, selective spinal immobilization also is um, required down, uh, it can be performed down to the first responder level now. It is required down to the basic level. 
automated blood pressure device that goes along with the current monitors that we use. I believe that's it. Do you want to go over Thank the you. second page? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Gisha? Thank you, Your Honor. I was hoping to, that that would be the last one, but it, it, it sparked a, a, a question uh, regarding um, uh, what you want. I mean, I know you're not board members, so I, I'm trying not to put you in board member hats, but the question has been, okay, we have a fire department proposal and we have an Orange Cross proposal. And my understanding is the only Orange Cross proposal we have is what we've got and your, your programs and, and care for 10 more years. Is, am I accurate with that? That was our initial request, a 10-year extension so we can do some long-term planning. Mr. Isbell, a lot of the questions that you, uh, that have been asked, or some of the questions that have been asked by Alderman, you've responded by uh, that the board would have to make that decision. If the board is a deciding body, uh, may I ask why they're not here? Any of them? <clears throat> Based on the uh, short-term notice, uh, they had prior commitments. They were able to attend the last couple of weeks as many as they could. However, tonight did not work out for them. Did any of them attend the City County Sheriff's Service Committee meeting on Friday? I don't believe so. Thank you. Alderman Renfleisch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Isbell, again, um, as part employee or half-time employee, I guess, of Aurora facilities, um, as we know, there's a rather large and, uh, entity in the state of Wisconsin. Um, are you aware of other areas where they operate with uh, city-run fire department ambulance services that they are interested in proposing a, a private entity or a nonprofit entity to take over that instead, or are they in general comfortable working with city fire departments? My understanding, La Crosse is going to the same uh, situation that we are here, where okay. the uh, private is trying to be uh, taken over by the local fire department. Follow. But you're not aware of necessarily that orange that Aurora itself and other areas they operate have any difficulty or any problems or any issues that working with a, a city run. None. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'd ask the uh, fire chief, Commander Herman, Commander Butler, to come up. Chief. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, citizens of Sheboygan. I also would like to thank um, all the me members of the fire service that are attending tonight. Um, their representation here is to show the um, level of commitment to the state of Wisconsin. Um, many of the communities, if you look at the patches of the individuals on their shirts and and uniforms here, you see that they're representing communities like ours throughout the state, and these are firefighter uh, paramedics that, that are here tonight. And much of what they've heard in the Orange Cross presentation is the same level of service that's being provided all over the state, and um, I'm certain those individuals will be willing to, to testify to that effect. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor and members of the council for their diligence in working through this very difficult process. While the process might uh, seem short to many people here, it's involved many, many years of research, planning, and, and information, um, including presentations to and discussions with the private ambulance provider. Um, we gave a full presentation, three, I believe it was three hours, at the Committee of the Whole. We have given individual presentations to all the persons so we have the ability to discuss in detail the information. It's a very difficult topic. And it's very difficult to, uh, um, to do in a, a full uh, meeting setting. I think we accomplished that at the Committee of the Whole last week. Uh, I think uh, 
one of the older persons hit on it, that we were um, engaged in discussions with uh, the Orange Cross Board of Directors for a number of months with the attempt to consolidate the service into the Sheboygan Fire Department and the City of Sheboygan, very much like uh, what had occurred in Manitowoc in 2003. And um, we gave many reasons why we believe fire-based EMS is a positive thing for the community and the area, um, including incorporating all the rescue services, um, upgrading of our first responder capabilities, and long-term commitment to uh, uh, supporting uh, a paramedic service that includes uh, maintenance of uh, personnel over a long period of time and retention of personnel. Having gone through this process in 2002 and having discussed with many of the previous chiefs the processes that have been going on since 1988, um, I recognized that uh, there needed to be a long-term commitment to this. And while this, I said earlier, this process seems short, I can attest to from what the other chiefs told me and what I went through in 2002 that the time and effort expended by the mayor and all the members of this council, regardless of whatever side of the issue you may be on, has far exceeded any uh, commitment and interest and involvement in the previous processes. So for the public, uh, I just want to assure them that we fielded many, many, many questions, had many hours of discussions, and I know the council people have followed up to a great degree with a number of different individuals, both from Orange Cross, from the fire department, and others outside of those agencies to ensure that they're well informed for the decision that they're going to make. And have approached it in a very serious and thoughtful manner and with the citizens and the taxpayers of Sheboygan in mind. So I think they should be commended for that. Right up front, I would also like to commend uh, my two commanders sitting here, Commander Herman and Commander Butler. Um, as well as other members of my staff who have worked countless hours on this uh, very diligently, um, long days, off days, uh, whatever, to try to answer all the questions that came forward from, from the council people, from the public, and we have not turned away a phone call, a uh, conversation with anybody um, that uh, has asked for one. So I would like to thank them very much for that, that commitment. As you all know and found out, and some of you all the persons up front when I told you that this would be a controversial issue, question, you know, wh why it's like that, and it just evokes so much emotion. And um, a as we predicted, that would happen. And uh, the one concern I have is uh, what Alderman Gisha brought up, that um, this dialogue with Orange Cross Board of Directors has been ongoing for quite a period of time. And uh, as we've heard concerns from some council persons, some county people, and some citizens, I've not yet heard, uh, and we've heard some of the answers tonight, um, but I've not heard any kind of commitment or question answering regarding Orange Cross's viability in serving the county and inner facility transports. And we have always been open to looking at, at the entire process of consolidation into the fire department here. But I believe the first step needs to be a commitment by this council to move forward for the city 911 service. That opens doors of opportunity for us to work with the county and the hospitals and the, and the current EMS providers in the area to work cooperatively. Until we have that commitment, we don't really have anything to offer them. As I stated several weeks ago, as a department head, and particularly in these very difficult times, I believe it's our responsibility to bring forth ideas and concepts that assist our city administration and council to better serve the city and help meet, meet the need for the community uh, quality of service at, at affordable taxpayer costs. We've all talked about and we've heard taxpayers say they're, they're taxed enough, but they still want the same level of service. People have always been very impressed by the level of service that the city has provided in a number of different areas, not only the fire service. And we want to continue that commitment, and we believe um, the provision of transport services allows us to continue to provide that excellent service that we've done in the past and actually bring it to a new level. If this resolution is passed tonight, our department looks forward to working cooperatively with the mayor the Common Council, Sheboygan County, and the EMS community to ensure that ambulance transport needs of all Sheboygan area residents are met with quality and efficiency. 
and that a coordinated transition process is put in place to meet the needs of all involved. Um, there's a couple comments I would just like to make, um, and then I'm going to open the floor to Commander Herman to um, clarify a few issues that came up at the Committee of the Whole meeting, and then Commander, but Commander Butler will comment uh, as necessary as well. Uh, just on a couple issues that came up um, during discussions uh, from the Orange Cross personnel here. And I guess to, to understand um, uh, our perspective is I don't see any reason to believe that the quality of paramedic service to our community will suffer in any way with the fire department providing that service. And there, that's for a number of reasons. One is, and uh, Commander Herman can touch on this, we do have a number of paramedics within our current organization with many, many, many years of experience, both inside our fire department organization and in, in other EMS organizations throughout the area, which includes people who are currently working in ambulance services. We also have a number of former Orange Cross employees who are familiar with the way the system works in the city of Sheboygan and uh, uh, have worked in the system and are eager and excited to continue to do that. Uh, our hiring standards are probably more stringent than the private ambulance providers, and I would not expect that to change. Cross-trained firefighter paramedics are the norm, as you see in the, in the audience here tonight throughout the state of Wisconsin. And quite frankly, if we don't move in that direction to bring those people into the, our community, they're going to go elsewhere, and we're going to be the losers um, to that end. Uh, the long-term retention of paramedics does more to grow the system and provide that long-term excellent paramedic care than a constant turnover of, of new people. That's not to fault the new people coming in. It's not to say that they're not going to be good paramedics. But when you look at a system that can bring people in and retain them for a period of time, they work on the ambulance for a period of time, and then they move into other uh, advancement opportunities within the fire department, or um, go to engines or, or, or other vehicles and, and other responsibilities within the department, you do not lose that level of experience um, in the community. It just moves on to a different position. You get your new people in, and that, that system continues to grow. And I believe um, with that model in place, the hospitals will grow very comfortable with working with our people um, with uh, providing uh, any kind of expanded level of care because they're going to see those same people over and over and know that it's a long-term commitment and uh, those people will be there for, for a time to come and that trust will grow. The commitment from Aurora Hospital um, to, to work uh, cooperatively with the fire department is a very important aspect of this. Anybody who believes that we're going to implement a paramedic service on January 1st of 2008 and just throw people on that ambulance has not watched the way our department and other fire departments have operated within the state of Wisconsin and the United States. Um, we look to work cooperatively between now and then with, with the hospitals to get our people in, to have a comfortability level with, with uh, the people at both hospitals, and look forward to expanding that relationship. We also look to get our people working in other communities prior to the implementation of the service to uh, gain experience and look at the best practices of all the other communities that are out there already doing this. So um, just as a, um, a word of notice that we would look forward to working with all those people and having our people as prepared as possible by January 1st of this next year. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Commander Herman uh, to do some clarifications and provide some additional information. Thank you, Chief, Mr. Mayor, and members of the Council. Um, as Chief Lestusky did state, um, should we take over the ambulance service in January, it's not our intent to hire paramedics strictly out of school. We would be hiring experienced paramedics. And to give you an example of the 11 paramedics that we have on staff, in addition to the one registered nurse who would qualify as a paramedic, um, our paramedics have 17 years of experience, 17 11, 6, 5, 5, 5, 7, 5, 2, and 2 years of experience. They've come from Orange Cross Ambulance, Bell Ambulance, DeKalb County EMS, LaGrange County Hospital and EMS, Random Lake, Plymouth, Fond du Lac Fire, Paratech, 
Ashland Fire, Sturdivant, Medix, and the list goes on and on. So we do have qualified, experienced paramedics on staff. A couple of things that I'd like to address from uh, the Committee of the Whole meeting a couple weeks ago that need clarification. Uh, Mr. Isbell did bring up that our Medicare, Medicaid mileage reimbursement figures were incorrect, and that is right. Um, we, we did figure in the rural rate, which is 938, and we should have had the urban rate in, which is 625, as he did point out, and that would uh, come up with about a $10,000 less revenue uh, across our proposal. Uh, it was brought up by Ms. Selman that between the hours of 4 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. of the landmark fire that there were eight calls for an ambulance. In researching the city 911 calls, there were actually two during that time period, uh, one at 2201 Erie Avenue, which the PD did first respond to, and one at 24 Beechwood that our Engine 6 did respond to. And I know that has been a subject that's come up as to how are we going to respond to med calls and fire calls at the same time. A number of years ago, the North Shore Fire Department did go through the same process, and they went through a process of figuring, figuring out what the risk of the two calls happening at the same time were. They came up with a three-tenths of 1% chance of that happening. And one of the reasons is the majority of medical calls happen during the daylight hours. Majority of time-consuming fire calls happen at night when they go undetected and, and they happen to be longer calls for us. After looking at this information, I did go back to the year 2006 and researched all our calls. There actually was only one instance where a medical call came in during the time that we were at a fire call. And that call came in 18 minutes after the time that we arrived. And our first unit actually cleared that fire scene at 30 minutes. So we would have had somebody else available in that instance also. A uh, question came up two weeks ago about dispatch, about emergency medical dispatch. And I think uh, that issue was confused a little bit. Um, our dispatch center is top notch. Our dispatchers are highly qualified, highly trained. They do practice emergency medical dispatch. They're good at it. I think where the confusion came was we don't have the ability because they are dispatching for a separate service, Orange Cross, of not sending a first responder unit to the calls that don't need the first responder. Because of the liability, we have to send a first responder fire truck in the current system to every single call. If we were to provide the ambulance service, the dispatchers would be able to choose which calls, or our paramedics would choose which calls that we don't need to send that fire truck to, which saves efficiency and tax dollars for the city. Uh, responding to the, the comments about the 9.2% rate increase, those numbers were taken from the past six years of experience from Orange Cross, which raised their BLS rates 105% in the last six years and their ALS rates 64%. And now they've said that they've readjusted the way they build some of their medical supplies, and that may be so. But also in the proposal that we gave you, where we did show the 9.2% projected increase, we also did show you a 3 and a 5% projected rate increase, which we felt was a more fair increase. Those also did show a reasonable profit. And, and with this proposal going forth for the fire department, the rate increase is up to you people in the council. You set the rates. It's not the fire department. You have control over that. If you decide to charge non-residents more than a residence, you have the ability to do that. Approximately 7.8% of the calls that we respond to are non-residents. City of Manitowoc does, believe, I believe, separate their calls and charge $100 more for non-resident. With that, I would open the floor to any questions for the three of us. Alderman, any questions? This thing's going up like a Christmas tree here. <laughs> All the lights. Alderman Meyer, you hit it first. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, during the Orange Cross presentation, it was suggested that um, lifting the patients 
was going to be a problem for the for the fire department. Um, do you not have like weight requirements of how much you have to lift, and are you going to be injured lifting patients when you respond to calls? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think part of this goes back to that memo in 2005, and um, there's there's a background to that. At that time, the Sheboygan Fire Department was was responding to private party assistance calls from Orange Cross Ambulance, um, non-emergency calls I'm talking about, whereas somebody privately calls Orange Cross and says, I need to be transported from point A to point B, and uh, Orange Cross responded there, non-emergency, to transport that person. At that time, when there were um, heavy people or difficult lifting circumstances, Orange Cross uh, would contact the fire department for lifting assistance. And there was a concern from the then risk management department of the city that, and, and our department as well, that we were putting our people at risk to, to uh, subsidize a private ambulance service doing private business. And there was one incident um, of, of a EMS call that resulted in a, a um, significant workman's comp claim dating back to 2002. Since 2002, there have been four EMS-related workman's comp injuries um, that have been reported on our OSHA logs. That's four since 2002, and n none of them have been significant injuries. Um, it should also be noted that our people are re now responding to all the 911 calls in the city, and we are lifting and assisting lifting at any of those calls that is necessary, and obviously the ones that we are doing the lifting on are the ones that um, are most needed at that time. There's an added value of our people working together with each other because there's a comfortability factor and teamwork factor that um, can be trained and uh, um, worked through um, within our department and within our, our own personnel. So, you know, that's really the background of how that workman's comp issue came about. Thank you, Chief. Alderman Bulk. Chief. Uh, um, everybody thinks, I think everybody thinks I'm the numbers guy, and all I've been doing is crunching numbers. It's not about numbers for me. It's about quality of care first. Without quality of care, we have no reason to even be talking about this. Are you guys going to do this stuff? Is there any reason to doubt that the things that Orange Cross mentions, that there will be any change in the quality of care for the citizens of Sheboygan? Um, I'm not a big numbers guy. I, uh, I, I, I kind of forget things, actually. Um, but I can speak to the quality issues. Um, the scope of practice for a paramedic is pretty standard in the state of Wisconsin. There are, um, within that scope of care, there are certain skills, some of which are listed on this sheet here, that do require special training and special approval by a medical director. I have absolutely no reason to believe that within our own system and given the quality of our paramedics, that uh, a cooperative effort with the hospitals and the uh, medical direction in this community, um, where those skills would be necessary, that we wouldn't be able to perform them equally as well and uh, come up to speed very rapidly on those, on those skills. And, and, I, and I, I commend Dr. Martin. She, I, there's no doubt Dr. Martin is a highly qualified medical director. I, I, can't, I can't argue that. And uh, certainly her input would be sought as a large contributor in the county to medical care, and we would like that across-the-board cooperation for the entire county. So we hopefully would be the other 10% that could work cooperatively with her as well. Um, but absolutely, there is no reason to believe that our paramedics couldn't be... Um, trying to do any of those things as well, some of which already are. Please. Um, and there, I've been getting questions from constituents about, is it going to be two ambulances or three ambulances? And I just want to ask, uh, will you abide by the resolution which calls for three ambulances 24-7 starting January 1st? Is that what's contained in your business proposal? That is contained in our proposal. That ultimately is up to you. There's an expense for the way that we will man those ambulances. We can do that. It is contained in there. And it has to do with some of the overtime that's in there, right? Because, because the first year, if we are only running the city 911 calls and we only have 18 or 19 paramedics on staff, our overtime will need to be increased to call back during those vacation times to call a paramedic back to staff that third ambulance. So the numbers we've looked at are for three ambulances, 24-7, 1st of January. The, uh, 
to do to staff the three, the overtime would have to be increased approximately thirty thousand uh, dollars. But again, that's a whole numbers of calls, and we'd need to go over that. But that's totally up to the uh, to the council people. But yes, we can do that. And there was a provision for I think fifty thousand dollars in overtime in there. So you've actually over budgeted for the overtime needs. Correct. Thank you. Alderman Vanderbilt. Thank you, Honor. Out of all the questions, <clears throat> excuse me, out of all the questions that I received, I'm going to ask this question, and I talked to Commander Butler, and this one's for you, because this one concerned me most. Uh, it's been assumed that Madwalk was given skills to boost, uh, to boost their profits, as, such as IVs to every patient that, that they pick up. And I would ask uh, if anybody here knows anything about that, and if... Uh, if we plan on giving IVs to every patient? I believe I actually understand the question. The, I was at that meeting at Manitowoc and there was a representative from Tri-State Ambulance who was involved in the process currently in, in the city of La Crosse. And it was construed somehow from the comments of the then medical director at Manitowoc and, and indeed the current medical director at Manitowoc there was a statement made by that medical director that said, and this is paraphrased to some degree, that if you're sick enough to be in an ambulance, you're sick enough to get an IV. There is nothing in there. Basically what he was looking for, if I understand his words correctly, was that they want to make sure that when a person needs an IV, they're getting one. It does not say you have to start an IV on every patient that's in the ambulance. What he's saying is if there's a patient that does not need an IV, I need to see written documentation and justification for why that is not done. The suggestion by anybody that a service, especially a fire department, would be starting IV simply to boost to an ALS um, billing rate is absurd and unethical and probably illegal at some point. Um, that's not the case. That was not the intent of what he was saying. Um, it should never be construed that way, and it was not the way I took it as well. Thank you. Alderman Rinfleisch. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, you mentioned efficiency. Currently, the, uh, the fire department is responding to 100% of the um, uh, 911 calls right now. Um, can you give me an estimation of the costs to the city uh, that, that entails? Um, basically, the question is, under the current plan, uh, Orange Cross responding, um, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, it to some degree, there's still a cost right now under the current system of the fire department responding to 100% of the calls first responder. Can you give me an idea how much that is, how much the taxpayers are paying strictly at this point in time under the current system? I don't think I can give you an exact amount. A lot of it is rolled up into our fire department operations. We do have some training costs that... Uh, um, our, our total training budget right now is roughly $10,000. That includes fire EMS training. And part of that is to maintain licensure of our people at their current level uh, of, uh, of abilities. Um, there's obviously fuel and, and some equipment costs um, that are associated with it, but I can't give you an exact number. In looking at those efficiencies, one of the things that we look at is um, we will still maintain a first response capability both for fire and EMS and all of our, our fire districts. And then there will be ambulances strategically placed in, in, um, in some of the stations um, to handle the, the transport portion of it. And what we'll be able to do is um, in those instances where there's a first response uh, and ambulance um, in the same station, if the call comes in and it's a person who slides in the second base and, and hurts his ankle, the, the communication will be there to be able to say, you know, the ambulance could say, you know, you stay in station here. This is an ambulance response, and that will, will, will um, incorporate some savings into the first response portion of it. And that's where some of the efficiencies are built in. But I can't give you an exact number on what our first responder costs are at this time. So the follow-up. Um, but in general, uh, would you, you would agree, though, with the statement that under the current system, there is no cost to the taxpayer is really kind of false. There is a cost right now uh, as is. Is that That's correct? That's accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman, President Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate that. Uh, Commander Herman, Commander Butler, Chief Lasusky, 
before I ask my question, I do want to tell you that I really appreciate the fact that you guys were up front with me from day one when these discussions started. Uh, you've given me access uh, all hours of the day to ask your questions, and I really appreciate you guys going above and beyond. Uh, you said this was going to be uh, contentious and challenging, and you didn't underestimate that. You were, you were honest with that also. Um, question, the last Friday at the um, shared services meeting, um, one of the uh, county board members um, implied that uh, Orange Cross has physical locations uh, in Sheboygan County outside of the city. Can you tell me where those physical locations are? Um, currently, Orange Cross responds to their service area, which is somewhat of an arc around Sheboygan from all their stations within the city of Sheboygan. Um, I believe Memorial, St. Nick, uh, and there's a south side station and, and sometimes um, a service on New Jersey Avenue. Um, if the council, if the county move forward with a process to have um, the fire department serve areas outside um, or equivalent to what Orange Cross is doing, our station locations are set up just as well or maybe even better in some instances to respond out of our North 15th uh, and North Avenue station, the far south side station at 18th and Marbury and our 25th Street station um, near Kohler Memorial Drive. So I, I think there's an equivalency there, if not uh, uh, a benefit to those outlying areas if we responded from, from our current stations. But there's no, no stations currently outside of uh, the city of Sheboygan. Thank you. Vice President Bourne. Thank you, Your Honor. I've got a, a, que a couple of questions uh, having to do with the overtime. Let's say hypothetically, right now on the shift that you have going right now and you had the ambulance service and you had three ambulances that were called out and that would mean six staff would be dedicated to the ambulance, which means, or would that mean that technically you're not fully staffed for fire at that point would you have to call in six individuals uh, to bring yourself up to full staffing until those uh, paramedics got back to the station? And then just in follow-up to that, so I understand your overtime policy, is overtime from the time that the person leaves their home until they get to the station, or does the overtime start when they get to the station? I guess to answer the first portion of your question, uh, first thing we would do would call in two more paramedics to staff our fourth backup ambulance. Um, to answer the other question, uh, we still would have adequate fire protection. And I believe the third question was, when does our overtime start? Uh, it would start from the time the person gets the call and gets his belongings together and gets to the fire station. If I could follow up, please do. Thank you again, Your Honor. Uh, do you feel it's a hindrance in providing, first of all, fire service and also then ambulance service, the fact that half of your personnel don't even live in the city of Sheboygan? Is that going to be a hindrance for, for either service as going, going forward? I understand that you have some people in the department that live a great distance from Sheboygan. If you'd address that for me. There would typically be two sets of call-in lists, and we would utilize the people that are closest to the city for our initial call-in, <clears throat> which we uh, currently do now when we need people as, as quick as possible. Um, and I think you're probably leading into residency here, and I've always been a proponent of that. Um, it was this council that decided to eliminate that back when former Alderman Johnson was sitting in your seats back in the 80s. Um, that definitely would help us. If I could follow up on that. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. With all, due, with all due respect, uh, Chief Lestuska, I have to ask this question. Why do you think that your proposal amongst the taxpayers of Sheboygan has gotten an overwhelmingly negative response? My calls, when I separate, and not that they're not important, calls that I've gotten from people that are affiliated with the fire department, affiliated with Orange Cross, when I take those out of the mix, 90% of the taxpayers both from the 4th District and calls that I'm getting from outside the 4th District are negative, negative, negative to your proposal. Can you, can you give me an idea why you think that is? 
I can't answer specifically for the people calling, but I think uh, as all the persons, you've re recognized the complexity of this entire issue, all the different uh, um, angles that need to be looked at between response, costs, um, service to outside the, the community. And from what I've found and what I've heard from other older persons is that um, the majority of the people that have called don't have an understanding of what was proposed. Um, the majority did not see um, the committee of the whole. Um, I've had a number, fielded a number of calls personally with people that had some of the same concerns and questions that you bring forward, Alderman Bourne, and um, I tried to provide as much information to them as possible. Um, after those discussions, I'm not gonna say they were for or against that, but they had a much better understanding of, of what it was we were proposing. I mean, there's, there's a, a very concerted effort to, to bring people forward to contact all the persons from um, one of the hospital networks that involved letter writing campaigns, ads in the paper, with very little information attached to that or inaccurate information attached to that. And we committed up front that we weren't going to um, play the game in the media. We wanted to provide as much information as we could to you people who are making the decision on, on this process um, with the hopes that you'd be able to provide that information to the constituents as well as the way we did it at the Committee of the Whole. And uh, we've adhered to that through this process. We've had contacts from the media, we've had contacts from other, other organizations that have tried to play this in a different manner. And really our responsibility was to provide you with the information to make this, this decision. This is not a Sheboygan Fire Department decision. It's not the Sheboygan Fire Department Ambulance Service, even though we're the ones that will be charged with, with uh, providing that service. But this is a city of Sheboygan decision and a city of Sheboygan service that we will be providing. And um, um, I believe that we've accurately portrayed and provided as much information as we could to who was ever asked over this period of time. Thank you, Chief. A, a lot of aldermen still are asking to be recognized. Just be patient, bear with me. Alderman Clavinus. Thank you, Your Honor. Chief, um, would you be willing to having an uh, independent study of the whole situation for the whole city and county involved? Would you be willing to go undergo that? Um, I feel as if this is very political and it would be good to have people expert, ex with expertise in EMS to take a look at our city situation and our surrounding area situation because it will be affected. Would you be willing to uh, undergo that and go through a study with uh, some qualified consultants? There's been a number of people who have looked at proposals throughout the year, years, and um, there's no way that we can implement a service um, with any time frame other than what we have in, in, in place now. Um, the contract ends January 1st of, the, of this next year. There's a lot of work to be done between now and then. Um, our staff and, and department has expended a tremendous amount of time and energy on this and for this process to drag out over a long period of time um, as it already has, as it has in years past, I don't think is effective. I think there's enough information out there, um, enough models to look at, enough different cities and, and uh, county systems that the information is there. Thank you. Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Your Honor. I've got a number of questions here, so if you could bear with me, I would appreciate it. But before I ask any questions, I just wanted to comment um, and state my intentions, you know, be, behind the actions that I've taken to date on this issue. And I want to point out that I have nothing but the utmost level of respect for you, Chief Lestusky, and your man. I, I know a number of them, actually. Chuck Butler here is my next-door neighbor, and I know he's been a key factor in getting this report developed. Um, that being said... A couple of questions that I have is number one is on the medical director that was brought up a time or two tonight. What is our expense or will we have an expense for medical director as if we take over the ambulance issue? Currently we do not have an agreement with our medical director requiring remuneration. Um, certainly that'd be something that would be should that person decide to look at that we would look at it. Um, by the sound of the the fees um, that Dr. Martins receives, it would be a, a, certainly a minimal addition to our proposal. 
and uh, it would be pretty much dependent on what the medical director was requesting. Um, certainly that would be something we could look at. There is nothing in place at this time, and it is pro bono for us. Just so I understand the framework, though, we'll need one? We'll need a medical director. That's a requirement? Is that Absolutely. Right? Um, we'd be required to have a medical director. One thing I would like to add also is that um, per Mr. Bonk's letter to the council and per verbal discussions with him, he has committed um, Aurora's resources to assist us with trans transition and working into a new system. I would expect that there's opportunities. We've, in the past, as a first responder group, have had medical, medical direction from both hospitals um, and I would expect that um, there's opportunities both at Aurora and potentially, hopefully, at St. Nicholas Hospital to involve those people in the process, whether it's as co-medical directors or um, whether somebody else steps up and assists Dr. Coolis or, or takes responsibility for that long term. Um, certainly, we're open to that, and Aurora seems willing to, to work with us Good. On that. Good. Next question I have is on training expenses. We currently have about $2,000 a year in our budget, or, or at least our proposal here, is that correct? That's how I understand it, $2,000 per year. Is that training just cover the four additional, or does it cover the training for the 18, 19 personnel that are needed to run the ambulance service? Currently, we provide for the EMS training for those people involved. We do much of our training in-house um, with our own instructors or with instructors from LTC. We have a cooperative agreement with Lakeshore Technical College on that provision, that, that additional monies in there were um, for refresher costs for those four and some additional costs for um, other classes that we may have for the others. But uh, refresher costs, recertification costs for those other people within our, currently within our department are included in our current training budget, okay. and that 2000 was additional. Thanks. And that's one of the, um, I guess, points of contention I have. It's a small one because I realize that it wouldn't impact the bottom line here that significantly. But I would like to see all the training expenses that are related to the ambulance service be allocated to this cost center, not simply for the four new people. I mean, that's something that we can work out later on, I guess, as we organize the books if we go ahead here. Um, another question I have is on rate increases. I asked Orange Cross, and I fully intended to ask you as well, the last three years, this year they have a 0% increase. And not figuring that in, they've had a 4% average increase. Oh, was it 03, 04, 05? I think is what it was, 04, 05, 06 is what it was, a 4.1% 4, 4 increase. We have 9.2%, and it sounds, I guess if I put that in real dollars, that's about $66,000 annually, roughly speaking. That If we raise it 9.2 versus 3.4, the difference is a little over $60,000. Could you speak to that a little bit as well? When I took their numbers for the 9.2% increase. I went back six years to what their BLS rates were and their ALS rates were, and then I went up ahead six years or to what their current rates are now. That's where I came up with the 9.2%. And again, as Mr. Isbell uh, explained, they did change the way some of their billing was performed. I think they rolled in some of their supplies. So that may not be a completely accurate amount. Which the 9.2%. But if you look at the packet we gave you that figured in only a 3% increase, the system is still very profitable for us to take over the system. Okay, thanks. The other uh, main factor that I see is call volume projections. It's been somewhat erratic from what I can see looking at the Orange Cross numbers. 04 was 1,732 calls, 05, 1,848, 06, 1,757. Again, up and then right back down again. Again, that difference from 05 to 06 equates to about $65,000 in lost revenue from the year prior using an average call ratio. I think a 50-50 is what you were using. I guess we went back longer term than just one year because anytime you just go a short term, you're going to get spikes either way. And we did talk to other departments, the Manitowoc's, um, Fond du Lac's, Oshkosh, and did get a pretty average 3% increase from okay. the various sources. That's good. That's good. Um, another question, and in, I pointed out some of the deficits here. I'll give you credit as far as the ALS-BLS ratio appears to be inaccurate, but it's actually to your favor. I mean, it would be, it's $40,000 to your detriment, so it actually brings back some of the other negatives, I guess, that were put out there. So I just want to point that out as well. Probably the biggest concern I have, though, of all the questions I'm asking here is on personnel cost and cost allocation. Um, we currently, in our projections, we have about the equivalent of four people projected their cost against the revenues that we're projecting. Um, and it's my opinion from my experience is that 
anyone involved in the operation needed to make it run should be then allocated, their cost should be allocated up against those revenues. And I know we have, if you do the math, to cover 24-7, 365, we need 18 or 19 people. We talked about this on Friday with, with the City County Shared Services Committee. We talked about it specifically afterwards as well. And I realized that not all 18, or the equivalent of 18 people are going to be out on ambulance call all day, every day. So a portion of that needs to go back to the fire department. Could you share what that, of those 14 additional people, what percent of their time you would estimate will be allocated towards the ambulance issue? I guess first I'd like to address one of the other projections in our financial uh, portion. We projected a 48% collection rate. Orange Cross actually has told us, and their financial figures do show it, that they're at about a 58% collection rate. So that's quite a, a buffer in there also where we under-projected. To answer your other question about costing out a proposal, there's a, many numbers of ways of doing it, um, and I did speak with you on Friday. If we cost out all 18 of the paramedics to the ambulance service, uh, it comes out to about $1,080,000. Then you need to take that portion out of our fire department budget so the end net result is still the same income figure that you have. It's just where you move those figures around. I also did cost it out on an hourly basis of the time that our paramedics would be spending on med calls, on putting their ambulances back in service, on cleaning them up, on getting their medical supplies. Um, and as I told you, that number came out even better because if we took just an hour per call per paramedic, I came up with about 9,000 hours for the 2,200 calls. If you compare that to the wage and benefit number that we gave you, it comes out to only about a $65,000 cost compared to the $221,000 cost we gave you for the complete four paramedics. I just follow up on that. I guess in my mind, we have that the, the four people, the four new people are a cost no matter what. We can't go below that number because we won't be doing this unless we hire those four new people. So I mean, that's a, that's a net minimum cost. So from my standpoint, okay, we've got the expense of those four new people. Then it's an addition. What is the percentage of those 14, 15 remaining people? What is their cost that goes on top of those four people? Uh, again, I, when I figured out the per hour percentage, I used all 18 of them. So I guess it would be 14 eighteenths of the $65,000. And again, any way you want to put the numbers, the net result is always the same. It's just whether you're applying it to the fire department budget or to the EMS budget, the it, net number is the same. Thank, thank you. And I guess the reason I'm asking that is I would like to know if this, if this service could stand on its own if we just decided to split the departments or walk away from fire service. And obviously we never would do that. But could this ambulance service stand on its own two legs with the 18 personnel behind it? That's... With, with the revenue that it's bringing in? Correct. I guess the numbers do not show that it could do that, but then your fire department budget is offset by that million dollars, so the net amount is the same again. Thank you. Next, we have Alderman Rinfleisch. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, a lot of the questions I've dealt with, certainly we've talked about the numbers now, we've, we've covered a lot of that um, as well. Uh, and I was going to ask some of those. But the next one, I, I guess, comes to care, going back to that question again. Um, scenarios both for the immediate city of Sheboygan, um, um, as we get close to January 1st, if we do go this way um, and, and, and provide the, the ambulance service to the fire department, um, at this point in time, will we be up and running? Uh, what happens within the city um, the last week of December, Christmas time, if Orange Cross is going out of business and, and, and that's the, what, has, what the, their board decides has to happen, um, do we have enough coverage at that point in time? Uh, conversely then, my grandmother lives in the town of Sheboygan. Um, you know, we're talking about care here. Um, anything are we doing here putting them at risk outside the city boundaries as well? From early on, we've actually considered the transition as one of the most delicate parts of this whole process, whether we were looking at city only or whether we were actually looking at an entire system consolidation. Transition was always of the utmost of concern because there could be a potential of a lapse in service. The current service provider does have a contract through the end of this year. If there is a default on that contract, there are assets that get moved as well. 
Um, we do have paramedics on staff currently. We would make whatever adjustments we have to do if that's the case. We would like to get this service up and running as soon as possible, ready to drive out that door on January 1st, but actually be in place much earlier. Um, We'll do everything we can to do that. As far as the viability of the current provider and what their intentions are for the county, uh, surrounding communities, and for the city in the meantime, that's a question better answered by Orange Cross. Thank you. Next, we have Alderman Gisha. Thank you for being patient. Thank you, Mayor Perez. It's interesting you mentioned your grandmother living in the town of Wilson. I quoted earlier from Dan Bonk's email, and no need to repeat those quotes, Oddly enough, Dan Bonk, the executive vice president for Aurora, lives in the town of Wilson. He would be one that would be uh, removing or being part of this service theoretically. And uh, you heard his statements earlier. We've talked for weeks with, with all of you. I have, I know other aldermen have, and I, and I appreciated your candor because we've had some pretty difficult discussions. Uh, I was in a room with the four of you early on, and, and uh, they were pretty brutal which is okay, because that's how you come to good decisions. And I think the public needs to know that, that <clears throat> aldermen in this room, I think I'm speaking for every one of them, didn't just take your piece of paper proposal and run down the street with it in the air and say, we've got this great proposal from the fire department, let's go for it. I think for most everybody in this room, that was the beginning of this process in meeting with you, not the end of the process. And it's important for people to understand the, the hours and hours and hours spent in researching this. And in a lot of cases, uh, being very direct to the three of you in asking some very difficult questions. And I've appreciated those answers. Um, kind of a, a quick hit here of your reaction uh, to, to uh, citizen input, which is very important. Um, your staff doesn't want anything to do with this. They don't have any interest in a paramedic ambulance service in this city in the least, and you're forcing them to get involved with this. No, that's not accurate. And I guess I'd like to first touch base with uh, um, your commentary on uh, the amount of effort put into this up front. Um, if you think I'm sweating now, and our staff is, um, when Alderman Gisha uh, had us in the room and, and looked at our initial numbers, um, we were really sweating. And uh, not because we didn't feel it was the right thing, but because um, there was a business perspective um, that was applied to this process that we weren't quite familiar with. And um, it really tested us and, and pressured us and, uh, and, and put us in a, in a perspective where we needed to make some changes and look at this thing much more appropriately. As far as um, our people have always been committed to this process for many, many years, um, uh, we believe outside of the numbers that it's the right thing to do for the community. We've always believed that. Um, we recognize the sensitivity to, to numbers now, and that has been probably more of a focus than we would have liked it to be. Um, but uh, um, we're committed to this. Um, our firefighters are committed to this, and, um, and I know that we can do a good job for the community. Thank you, and follow up. Um the general sense, and you addressed it in your earlier arguments, that this is happening too quickly. I think you, I don't think there's need to go over that point. You've, you've stated that, although I do find it interesting that only in Sheboygan can something that's been worked on for almost 20 years be seen as too quickly. <laughs> only in Sheboygan. But that's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, Manitowoc loses money. Your example has always has been Manitowoc as a nearby model with some, uh, some parallels to Sheboygan. You say they make money. Others say they lose it. What's the answer? Well, I had hoped that, and we had prepared to have Manitowoc here last week, Monday. The finance director from Manitowoc, or assistant finance director from Manitowoc was here. Um, the deputy chief um, from their department that's in charge of EMS was here to provide that information to you. Um, I've had a number of contacts with the mayor of Manitowoc, the finance people up in Manitowoc, and what they did up front was similar to what the council would like to do here, I'm assuming, if this is passed, in that um, in their consolidation efforts up there, um, <coughs> they had their original fire department budget, and then they costed out, I believe, in some sort of enterprise fund, the additional costs of the consolidation equipment personnel and, and otherwise um, since 2003. Um, the council required that up there. The finance people have done that up there. 
And on average, on that consolidated uh, program that they're doing up there, they've shown, and I have the exact numbers here, but you know, one year's um, uh, generated a positive revenue of uh, 180,000. There's another year, 247. This last year, 249. The average has been approximately $200,000 since 2003 that that separate consolidated fund has, ge has generated. They've talked already at the Manitowoc level of, of just consolidating that budget into the fire department budget because they now have a track record of four years roughly where they've been able to track that and take a look at it. So those were numbers from the Manitowoc finance people. Those weren't from the fire department. I didn't make those up. Um, we asked point blank the finance director and assistant finance director in several meetings that we had with them and as recently as a couple weeks ago, would you, would you do this again, all you know, uh, operations and, and service aside financially, would you do this again if you were afforded the opportunity? And he said in a second, it's generating revenue for the city. And, that, and I wish they were here to be able to, to provide that information to you. Thank you. I understand they were here last week, That's prepared to do that. Um, and Manitowoc also has supplied uh, financial statements if asked. I know I received them, big long pieces of paper. Um, 18 or 19 paramedic firefighters, is that the end number? Will there always be only 18 or 19 paramedic numbers? Or are we just looking at January 1 with those numbers? That would be January 1, 2008. <laughs> Maybe you could speak to the future, because I think that kind of dovetails into a question of you can't do it with only those amount of uh, paramedics. We would anticipate an additional three paramedics each year. That's been our normal retirement rate for the last 30 years or so. So we would anticipate that number grows by th at least three every year. So theoretically, thank you, theoretically uh, over time you could have an entire fire department all paramedic trained. Theoretically, 30 years down the road, every person that goes out that door would go out a paramedic. Thanks. Uh, final question. Um, have you received, Chief, calls from any other municipalities who would be affected if the council decided to do this? And, of course, that would only be under the assumption that Orange Cross was not going to continue that service? Um, to the best of my knowledge, I've not been contacted by any of the um, governing individuals from any of the municipalities around the city of Sheboygan. Um, have you been, I'm sorry, have you been contacted by any county board members? Um, we had a contact with um, um, Mr. Gehring in December and a meeting with him uh, most recently a few weeks ago. I had one other contact from a county board uh, individual, uh, Supervisor Berg. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Alman Boak. Thank you, Your Honor. I have uh, one point of clarification and then some more uh, thoughts. First of all, I want to make sure that the city understands this Manning plan that I believe we've all seen, but based on calls from my constituents, I don't think they understand. Please make sure, uh, keep me honest here. These, seven, these 18 or 19 paramedically qualified firemen would never on any given shift be serving as both a fireman and a paramedic, right? They would be serving in one of those two roles on any given shift. Is that correct? That is correct. However, the flexibility is allowed to utilize those people for efficiency purposes for, um, for different functions. And I'll give you an example. Um, if there happens to be fire in one segment of, of the city, a med unit that's assigned to that area may respond to that fire and assist with some of the exterior functions uh, of that fire operation. However, they would be available for uh, medic response in, in that given area. But there'll be individuals assigned at, at minimum to two ambulances per day um, specific assignment, and then the other third one would be cross-staffed um, at times throughout the year. At sometimes it would be staffed fully. And it's that third ambulance that would be cross-staffed, and that's what allows you the flexibility to maintain this sort of Rubik's Cube of fire service and medical service with these 18 or 19 dual qualified people, right? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I've 
been receiving calls like uh, Alderman Bourne and Alderman Verhasselt, uh, people having all sorts of thoughts on this issue. And um, actually, once I get to talk to them and explain some things to them, the comments I get back aren't, aren't a universal no, 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 heck no. Uh, it's, wow, I, I guess I really didn't understand that. And maybe you guys have really been studying this more than, uh, more than the rumors uh, uh, are saying. Uh, and I'm actually able to convert many people to thinking that maybe we have done our homework. And I just want to put that out there because there, the, the, uh, there's clear rumor and, and misinformation being spread about what's contained in this proposal. And um, I want to take a stab at answering Alderman Boren's question about why is the city so against this? And I would posit to this group, the reason the city is against it is because they don't have faith in this body. It's not our friends at the fire department they don't have faith in. It's this body. This body has years and years and years of reputation of not asking strong financial questions. And this predates many of the people on this body, so it's not an indictment of any of them. But the reason people are against this proposal is because they don't have faith in two things. They don't have faith in this body to do the financial analysis necessary to decide whether it's right or not. And two, they don't have the faith in this body to hold those people accountable for the results that they say they're going to deliver on. So that's my stab at answering Alderman Boren's question about why the city is against it. And it's my prediction that two or four or six years from now, the city of Sheboygan, the citizens of Sheboygan are going to look back on the decision we make tonight and say that was the beginning of a change in the way and the sophistication of this Common Council's ability to do financial analyses of proposals. They're going to say, that was when we began to have faith in the Common Council to make smart financial decisions for the people of this city again. That's my prediction, and it's going to take us a while to get there. But this is a different council. This is a council with great skill in doing financial analysis, and that doesn't mean we don't need to hear from outside experts. But I can't reiterate often enough how many hours, tens and tens and tens of hours, of the people in this room, how, how much time they put into doing this financial analysis, things that we are qualified to do. And then in closing, I want to take a stab at answering uh, my distinguished colleague from the third district's uh, comment. I think he was asking a rhetorical question about should we take 18 people, should we burden this budget with 18 people's worth of, uh, of uh, labor? And, and that clearly, because he knows the answer to that question because of his time in business as a new products manager and as a businessman, he understands the concept of contribution margin and marginal costs. And I want to take a minute, Your Honor, about three or four minutes here to talk about what that means. Contribution margin is the dollars you can take in. A, a, new product, a new project would contribute to the bottom line if you were to invest in it. Let's just say, theoretically, I have a sausage factory. Because I do have a sausage factory. <laughs> and let's say I have buildings, and I have trucks, and I have, uh, and I have grinders, and I have stuffers, and I have buildings, and I have infrastructure. And that's my sausage business. And I run that business very well, and I run it every day. And let's say I want to get in the pineapple sausage business, whether that's a good idea or not. Let's say I want to get in the pineapple sausage business. I've already got that building and those people and that st stuffers and grinders. All I need to get in the pineapple sausage business is a pineapple squisher, we'll call it. And I need four people, let's say. I need three operators and a maintenance person for that pineapple squisher. So if I'm going to evaluate whether or not to get in the pineapple sausage business, I need to take the, the extra costs I have, the cost of the pineapple squisher and the four people I have to hire, I have to take that and evaluate it against the revenues that will come in from my pineapple sausage. And the important point to realize here is if uh, the mayor wants to get into the pineapple sausage business, it's much more difficult for him because he's got to first build a building and he's got to hire 80 people and he's got to buy trucks, and he's got to buy finance people and marketers and all that, and then he's still got to buy the pineapple squisher and the four people to run it. That's the idea of contribution margin. Um, and, and Orange Cross is burdened with $1 million in fixed assets that the only reason they need it is to be in the pineapple sausage business, it, it, is to, to have ambulance service. Uh, the Sheboygan Fire Department, they've got the buildings. They've got 14 eighteenths of the people already. And so their incremental costs, their marginal costs for getting into this project are uh, four paramedically qualified firemen 
and uh, the lease on three ambulances. That, that's all it takes to get in. And I want to give you one more illustration. If the pineapple sausage thing isn't working, because I've been accused of voodoo economics with my pineapple sausage uh, illustration, so I'm going to take another stab. I, I've got uh, Al Rudnick. Here's an example. Let's say Al Rudnick of Rudnick Jewelers. If he wants to get into the business of selling watches, it's a lot cheaper for him to get into the business of selling watches than it is me. Because if I want to get in that business, I have to buy a building, and I have to hire people, and I have to buy inventory. So again, his marginal expenses for getting in that, the way he would evaluate the success of a watch program, much different than if I were to get into that. And then finally, for my, uh, my distinguished... Uh, um, uh, member of dist uh, uh, constituent from District 2, um, Dennis Radke, that owns Urbane. If Dennis wanted to get into the business of selling, uh, selling Guinness beer, it would be much cheaper for him because he's got a bar, he's got staff, he's got bills already paid, he's got distribution set up. All he has to do is buy a Guinness tap and, and train his people to put the little shamrock on the phone when he's done. If I wanted to get into the Guinness beer business, I'd have to buy a building, I'd have to buy all those other things, plus the things he would have to buy. So I, I can't iterate enough the very common financial practice of contribution margin and marginal costs. And the only thing, the only reason I would even talk to Chief Lestusky about this three or four weeks ago was because of the realization that Orange Cross has a million dollars in overhead burden that he doesn't have. So I thank your honor for your indulgence, but I think that lesson is important to teach the people of Sheboygan about the financial principles that make this make sense. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alderman Bauk. We have three more aldermen. Alderman Matty, wish to speak. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, Alderman Balk, I'm dreaming of pineapple sausage right now. <laughs> I've had no dinner, so <laughs> sounds good to me. <laughs> this is nice and simple, but it's very practical. Uh, with 2,200 911 calls per year, that comes out to about on the average six per day. Give us the worst case scenario, if you know it, from the recent history from two or three years, what's the greatest, greatest number of calls in a 24-hour period that we may have to respond to as a fire department if we are providing that service? I don't have the number to give you of the greatest amount of calls that we've seen in a 24-hour period. I actually broke it down into smaller numbers than that. Uh, for the last 12 months, up to um, roughly the middle of May, there were 237 times when two ambulances went out within the same hour time period. And the reason I picked an hour time period was we felt that that was the turnaround time for that ambulance going to the call, getting to the hospital, getting themselves back in service and available for another call. In that same 12 month time period, we identified that there were 32 times when there were three called out at one time. When we dropped that down to a 45 minute time period, there were only 20 times when three ambulances were called out within that same hour time period. There were only three times within an hour and a half when there were four ambulances requested in that same 12 month period. Again, that was only three times were four ambulances within an hour and a half. So we feel that one of those would have been back in service again, but we would have been initi initiating a call back to get our fourth ambulance in service for those times. Thank you. Alderman Perhassel. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, by the way, I don't like pineapple sausage. <laughs> don't go there. Um, Quick question I had, it came up at the City County Shared Services Committee meeting last week, is the whole concept, and the county kind of animated this, is that what happens if this cellular 911 thing is not worked out? It's obviously a growing and a large portion of our, our call volume. They had, and for everybody here, they had animated that the county would have the authority to dispatch to Orange Cross in lieu of Sheboygan Fire Department having an ambulance service, which would largely undermine you know, the, the bottom line. Um, yeah, we did hear that at, at the Shared Services Committee meeting. Right now, cellular 911 calls, all of them are um, for the city of Sheboygan area are transferred to city police department dispatch. That includes police, fire, EMS, or a combination of those things. And um, the proposition that that system would be circumvented, um, I believe, uh, flies in the face of cooperative effort. 
um, may or not may or may not be something they actually can or would be willing to do. I would believe the county would be assuming some risk and responsibility in assuming uh, um, that type of posture. Uh, one thing is, are they going to pick and are they going to send 911 calls through for the police department? Are they going to send 911 through calls through for the fire department? Are they going to uh, dispatch the first responders? Um, to fragment that system it flies in the face of what has been done as a long-term practice. And I would suggest that um, um, if they would try to employ that, I'm not saying that, that they will, um, it would um, fly in the face of safety for the community. Thank you, Thank you Chief. Uh, we have one more alderman, Clayunas. Clayunas. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, isn't it true that the Manitowoc Fire Department um, took over the unified EMS service in Manitowoc? So when we say that they're successful, it's because they have everything that their unified ambulance service had. Right now, the proposal is just to take over the 911 service in the city. And, um, you know, you're basing your numbers on a small part of that market, whereas Manitowoc had the unified AMS handed over to the fire department. They worked it out, and the whole thing went over to the fire department. Uh, I just don't know if we're comparing apples to apples here, if we're doing part of the service and then Orange Cross could have the other part, and we're saying that's profitable. When Manitowoc says they're profitable because they have everything. Uh, that's a good question. Um, when Manitowoc did take that over, they did take a larger service over at that time, but they also added 10.5 employees at that time. So, you know, that reflected in... Um, you know, their expense lines, and uh, we've costed out this as presented to you based on the number of calls that we'll be responding to based on our costs of equipment and personnel. Um, so if the system would be larger, there'd be more costs and expense associated with that, and that's what occurred in Manitowoc, but they still were able to, even with those added costs and additional personnel, um, um, they were able to make it work up there. Okay. And one more. Um, Vice President Bourne. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> another, question, another question that I've been receiving uh, from constituents is that if in the event that Orange Cross would go out of business and you would have to take over the service for the entire county, uh, how many additional paramedics would you have to cover or would you have to hire uh, would there be any bricks and mortars involved in having to place ambulance more strategically? Have you run any numbers on that yet? I believe the question of buildings has already been covered, that I think that we're positioned adequately, if not better, than Orange Cross presently is. Um, we have run the numbers on the entire system. The additional paramedics would be 12 additional to the four that are in this proposal and the numbers are proportionate all through that, that proposal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so what you're saying then, uh, if you had to take over the entire county, you'd probably be up to about eight ambulances, is that right? Seven or eight. Seven or eight, yeah. and then with your, with your existing fire stations, you would, uh, I know with, you, were, you were saying with the original three and then one backup, that would be able to be housed in the fire departments that you have right now. So you would be able to take on another three ambulances if you had to in your existing fire stations without having to build further? Uh, yes, we would. If we would look at taking over that entire system, it would more than likely be four first out ambulances. And we do have room for that, and we do have room for the three backup in the existing stations without modification. And if I could uh, address another concern, I think Alderman Balk brought this up with our coverage and our callback for paramedics, especially in the first year when we only have 18 or 19. Uh, one of the documents that was presented to you by Mr. Isabel listed our starting paramedics as getting 14 days of vacation. Our starting paramedics don't get any vacation their first year. This is my 27th year of service to the fire department. I got my 14th day of vacation this year. So there isn't that amount of vacation coverage in those first years that is being reported. 
Alderman Verhessel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, could you share what that net revenue figure would be for the county run service? I mean, right now we're averaging, or we're looking at 195,000 end of next year at a five year projection, close to a half a million. How do those numbers specifically look at the county level? Uh, beginning in 08, the Rep net revenue is three hundred and forty thousand seven hundred and seventy eight dollars going up to four hundred and twenty five thousand eight sixty eight in two thousand and twelve thank you and what was the assumed growth rate on that one uh, was that nine two or was that no that's at what we did was do a um, a blended rate of blending the rate increase along with the projected call increase volume and just did a straight 5% across the board of those two blended rates. <clears throat> Excuse me, if I just might add to that also, um, when we looked at these county-wide um, or system-wide numbers, we utilized Orange Cross's um, financial data, eliminating some of the contractual things that they do that we may not do and just use their gross revenue, net revenue, and then overlaid our expense costs against that. Um, and we believe it's accurate because they're doing that system now. So those revenues, um, with the exception of those few that we, we did not include in that, should be similar and mirror what they're doing. Okay. I'd like to thank the chief and two commanders, thank Orange Cross for their participation in this debate. We've had it for about almost two hours. It's been a very, uh, very good debate. Uh, in addition to, as Alderman Bauck said, tens and tens of hours that have been discussed. The same issue has been discussed, and uh, I want to thank all the Alderman for it. Please call the roll. Alderman Rainflash. I'm sorry. Um, point of clarification on the order of the, the, the system here. Uh, the presentations were the questions posed uh, simply to the director or were those uh, the discussion and only the discussion so far um, allowed in terms of the three times that are allowed to speak? Was that outside the scope of our internal debate or was that part of Well, you can have some debate too if you want to go. If you want to keep going at it. Well, I, I, I'm done ans asking questions. Okay. I had like to okay. begin perhaps our debate here now. Uh, okay. I'll allow that. Would you like to go I first? I would like to speak actually then. Thank Please you. Please do. <laughs> Shocker. Eric would like to speak. Um, I guess we, before we really start here, we, we've heard a lot of terms thrown around that I find almost fallacious. Uh, the fallacy, first of all, of, of when people talk about how can a city do it more efficiently than private industry. Uh, and I think the private thing we need to clarify, Orange Cross is not an entity that pays taxes. It is really a nonprofit type of industry. Um, so a nonprofit degree... Um, um, was mentioned that there was a master of public administration is a lot different of a, of a degree than a master, master of business administration. How you deal with the very entities is a lot different. Um, so I think that those who are in charge of the fire department right now have that skills within the public industry, um, which is what a nonprofit really requires as well. Um, so again, we talk about private. It's private in terms of it's not run by the city, but it's not only a private enterprise that sausage factory has to pay taxes on, 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 on what they have. That's not happening right now in Orange Cross. Two, why change something that costs us nothing? And I think that's another fallacy because there is a cost involved to us right now ha having the first responder unit, responding to 100% of, of the phone calls. Um, while we don't necessarily have accurate numbers, we're still grabbing that big red truck. We're tearing down to the baseball diamond where little Timmy slid to second base and sprained. Um, that truck needs to be fully staffed in case there is a fire call somewhere else. So there's a cost involved. There's a fuel cost. There is a transit cost. There's, there's a cost of not having that person ready for a fire I and mean, what should happen to someone's life if that happens while that red truck is out of the, out of the garage. So at right now, it, it's false to say it doesn't cost us anything. It does. And it's costing the taxpayers 100% of those costs right now without the ability to recoup those costs at all, which having the, the ambulance service within the fire department would allow us to do. And then my favorite one um, is, is the shared services. Why change something when it's a perfect example of shared services? Um, shared services, in my mind, is really something where the two, tax, two taxing entities, city, county, or something, really work together with, and, and unify some kind of service that both are currently providing. Um, and we've talked about perhaps 
call centers for the police department as an example of shared services, something that we're both paying into and we get something out of. Once again, we're not paying anything into Orange Cross necessarily unless you get delivered by it. So we're not really disbanding any shared service. It doesn't exist right now. And in fact, you know, I've asked for uh, several uh, numbers here and I get various different things. The city of Sheboygan is just under half the population of the county of Sheboygan. Um, if you look at uh, real estate values and taxable values, there's a, a much lower number that way. But I came across basically an average of 40 percent. Uh, 40 percent of the county's dollars spent uh, is, is approximately um, coming out of the city of Sheboygan taxpayers. Keep that in mind, you pay 100 percent of your services as well. Uh, a little, maybe an overly simplistic example is when the snowplow goes by your house here in the city, you're paying 100 percent of that. In addition, that same snowstorm when the snowplow goes down the county road and plows it out, you're paying 40% of that. That homeowner that lives on that county road is only paying 60%. So the city taxpayer is paying 140% of snowplowing services, only getting 100% of it. So I urge, especially those who are discussing shared services, to please keep in mind the city taxpayer has already been taxed enough. Um, and I would be more than interested to, to sit and discuss shared services when it doesn't cost the Sheboygan taxpayer something that the county taxpayer gets a benefit of. I, I will be happy to talk about it when the county taxpayers assist the city of Sheboy, Sheboygan in lowering uh, their tax rates. Uh, and, and this, quite frankly, really has nothing to do with, with, with that at all. Yeah, in fact, if the county gets into it, it reduces our amount of revenue. So once again, we're talking to the taxpayer again if we allow the shared services to continue discuss, discussing that um, and with us. And we have an opportunity here. Now let me talk about this opportunity. Um, the question obviously is why are we jumping into this? Why are we doing this when this opportunity presents itself? Um, we've heard a lot of percentage numbers of people calling us that are opposed to uh, this service and I think first and foremost it comes from our uh, lack of perhaps educating the public into the, the, the fact that these numbers are real. Uh, we're not making them up. We're not being optimistic about them going, gee, I hope this works. I believe these numbers are accurate, and I think it's something that we really do need to pursue. Um, but I would say just that same number percentage of people have called me and said, don't do this. In fact, some of the same names have come across were also the ones that elected me into office just a few months ago and saying, you must hold the line on taxes. We are taxed out. We cannot afford any more taxes. Well, there's only two things we can do when we look at our city budget. We can cut services which unfortunately we're looking at the police department right now, um, and the community policing and the street crimes unit, or we can increase revenue. Well, obviously increase revenue, raising taxes is not something that our constituents are, are going for. Uh, so we have another opportunity here of bringing revenue in. And it is to those people that I listen to uh, when they ask the questions, and I pose the question back saying, well, what else should we cut? You're asking me to save street crimes units, and I got a vast amount of, of numbers calling that. How can I do that if I don't have revenue coming into the city? without taxing you more. Uh, so I have heard those people calling me regarding the Orange Cross service, saying, please don't do this, I'm against that. Uh, to them, I respond to say, I don't think we have a choice in the matter. We, uh, to keep the budget where we are, to keep the tax burden low, to provide the same level of quality healthcare service in terms of transportation that we can within the city, I think we really have to go in the direction of the fire department. All, all the answers, all the information that I've gotten from all different sides point in that direction. Um, so again, it's my broad vision. Yes, we have dove deep into the information that we've had in front of us. We've examined these numbers. We've asked very hard questions here tonight for two hours. Um, and, and, and the details, I think, sometimes we get confused in and lost it. I want to back that up to the broad stroke. I think to hold the line on taxes, to provide the best level of service, is just something that we really need to pursue and do it and get it ready now so come the end of the year, we, ha we have a proper... Um, Ambulance service in place for for all the city of city of Sheboygan residents. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alderman Rinfleisch. Next, we have Alderman Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. First, I want to apologize to the citizens and to the people in the gallery and all of you. Um, some of the statements that I make, I might be reiterating, but for the sake of um, the citizens in my district, I need to give an explanation as to where I stand on this issue. I have four points that I want to um, address, but before I do so, I just felt led to say this. Tonight, it has been um, stated that the direction of this council, one of the perspective why there's been a resistance is possibly that um, there hasn't been enough in terms of number guys on the council. And although I respect that and it has been a tremendous asset, um, I've always prided myself in 
adding a common sense approach. And part of that has been, and I'm giving a word of encouragement, that although I don't have a bachelor's in accounting, um, my experience has really helped me in giving a perspective for this job. And one of the experiences and wealth of knowledge that I um, gained from is last year in um, summer, I worked four jobs just to support myself. And you'll be happy to know, Alderman Bulk, that one of those jobs was at your sausage factory. So um, having said that, um, two points that I wanted to share is um, my personal and my professional experience um, that relates to this topic. And that is when I would, um, I had my own self-employment um, tax preparation um, business. And one of the things that we did, and myself included, is on a profit loss statement that we had to do um, for tax purposes. And some of the numbers that we have come across with Orange Cross has been, well, how is it beneficial to them to stay in business? The example was given $71,000 was a profit margin that they had gained for, I believe, 2006. Well, on a profit loss, if you have your business and you come out at zero, that is still good. That means that you're paying your salary, you're paying your bills, and all of your expenses. And sometimes it's even beneficial that you come in as a loss. So keep that in perspective. And we're talking about a nonprofit agency, which they're not in business to make money, but they still came out with $71,000 in um, revenue. So that's a good thing. Um, secondly, I had shared this analogy with elder person, elder person um, Geisha, and he'd given me a sample of approval, being a numbers guy, so I think I'll, I'll share it. And that is, I use the analogy, I, I was thinking about this because I've heard the term user fee. And I thought, what analogy could I use? And I'm thinking about my own. And that is when I used to rent in duplex homes and I had the lower unit, at a time in my life, I had purchased a home, a duplex. Now, renting is a user fee. But then I invested in that home. I was still getting the same level of service, but it turned into an investment. Um, it, it provided equity. I still got the same level of service. And I think that is pertinent to the subject that we're talking about here tonight. It's just my perspective. Two other points that relate to the input that I've received from citizens, and that is we need more time on this issue, and it has been brought up here tonight. Um, some people have said to me, and this tells me too what type of information they've been given. They've said, we just need six more months. Give it one more year. It has been reiterated, and to put this argument to rest, this just didn't come up three weeks ago. It has been stated over and over again that our fire department has been working with the board of directors. Um, we have, we've had long and lengthy discussions. We've provided ample opportunity for Orange Cross to give us their numbers, to come here tonight to explain their stance. So I wanted to alleviate that argument. And secondly, Orange Cross, they too did not provide us the courtesy to say, okay, we'll just do one more year. They are asking in their proposal 10. So I want people to keep that in mind. And lastly, as my perspective, to maybe just shed some light on what Alderperson Boren and Bulk had said tonight concerning why the negative response. And this is what my perspective brings. I have talked to people, and they have said, whether or not it's going to work with the Sheboygan Fire Department doesn't matter. They can talk until they're blue in the face. Even if it works, it's wrong because of the philosophy. Government shouldn't be in business for business. They shouldn't be providing that service. And as an older person, just in my third year, I mean, you guys know this. Shared revenue is on a decline. We have heard from our constituent base, no more taxes. Don't raise taxes. We are literally backed in the corner. What are we to do? Here is an opportunity to change. But I also know another philosophy that was ideal, and I understand it has its place. But I question now, is it feasible? And that is, it was unheard of for a woman to work outside the home. Because ideally, that's where her place was with her children. And I understand that, and I respect that. But I question now, too, where are our times? Where is it taking us? So that is my perspective on the negative response, is the philosophy. But given our times, we might have to get a little bit creative and meet somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Serta. Next, we have Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Your Honor. I, if it's appropriate at this time, I stand to offer an amendment to the resolution. Um, 
Yes, you may do that. Pardon me? Uh, I would like to offer the following amendment to the, the current resolution. Be it further resolved that beginning January 1, 2008 and ending December 31, 2012, that a freeze at this proposed level, oh, pardon me, I would like to restate that if you don't mind. It, I, don't, I want to make sure it's not ambiguous at all. Be it further resolved that beginning January 1, 2008 and ending December 31, 2012, that a hiring freeze is to be in effect for the City of Sheboygan Fire Department at this proposed level. This freeze can only be altered when and if the geographic service area of the fire department is expanded and then must be approved with a two-thirds affirmative vote by the Common Council. I've submitted a, uh, a copy of this, resolu this uh, amendment to uh, City Clerk Richards. It was discussed um, with the chief at the open uh, of the uh, committee, the whole meeting, and uh, without objection as well. I feel it's further protection for the taxpayer and keeps the, uh, the eye on the prize uh, for the uh, fire department when it comes to staffing levels and overtime. Is there a second to that motion? Second. second to the amendment. Under discussion, just the amendment. Uh, hold on. I have Alderman Ryan. Did, did you want to address the amendment? Before the amendment. Before the amendment. Okay. I'm going to turn everybody's lights off. Let's talk about the amendment. If you want to talk about the main motion, we need to hit them again. Okay? Otherwise, there's a mixture here. I'm shutting everybody down. On the amendment discussion, Alderman Rinsleish. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, I would like for those that are watching currently tonight at home, I guess, to hear from the chief that it is that the proposed amendment is not a difficulty or problem uh, for those that were not able to watch in the committee of the whole. Um, so it's no, they know that it's something that is something you're willing to work with. Chief. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'm in agreement that this is, is an appropriate measure. I guess I just would take issue with the wording of a uh, hiring freeze. Um, that we identify that the staffing level would be um, held at, at the proposed number um, effective January 1st um, as we're identifying here and that would not limit hiring to fill positions that are vacated through retirement and otherwise um, in that time frame. Alderman uh, Chief Lestusky, maybe I probably should have given it to you ahead of time. Uh, I, I think this answers that where it says um, uh, hiring freeze, perhaps maybe it should be hiring, uh, hiring freeze uh, when and if the geographic, oh, pardon me, to be in effect for the city of Sheboygan Fire Department at this proposed level. That was added uh, to specifically base, say that the proposal we have in front of us with your current FTEs plus these four is the intent of the, That's so we, you and I are in agreement and I, uh, anybody has a different opinion on the wording, but I think it covers it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Alderman Gisha. Alderman Rinsleish. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I understand the intent covers it, but correct me if I'm wrong, hiring freeze is even if someone leaves or they retire, you're not hiring anybody additionally. And if we're going to add this to the document, I would like to make sure that we clarify that in, in the, the legal language. Okay. Alderman Montemayor, did you want uh, Attorney McLean? Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. I agree that hiring freeze could be construed to mean that if there's somebody retires, you could not refill that position to get to the same level you were at, and I don't believe that that's the intent. Right, right. Um, I think you'd want to say uh, maintain or not exceed the staffing levels proposed in the, in the fire department's proposal or something to that effect. Uh, so that they would be able, under that uh, amendment, to hire people where there are vacancies, just so they don't exceed the, the levels that are established. Okay. Uh, we got... Uh, uh, is that a follow-up? All my right, uh, uh, Thank you. I think all well, the intent is that I just asked the, the author of the amendment and whoever seconded it to agree to that change. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, I do agree to the change, and we're all on the same 
playing here on trying to make it proper. If, uh, if the wording, uh, let me start from the beginning, be it further resolved that the um, beginning January 1, 2008, ending December 31, 2012, that the Sheboygan Fire Department staffing levels be limited to current levels of this proposal. Something to that effect. That that would get the word freeze out of it, right. and just and base it on the proposal, which it does tie into. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, be limited to current the current proposed level. Not to exceed. Not to exceed. Not to exceed. Not to exceed the current proposed level, and that would incorporate then the four plus the current. Friendly amendment to the amendment and second, accepted? Thank accepted. you. Under discussion on the amendment only, we had Alderman Montemayor. Yeah, I, it, no, I was simply going to, to talk a little bit about what Alderman Rinfleisch said in the end now. Thank you. We have next Alderman Ryan. Your Honor, I'm fine with it. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Manny, on the amendment. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I have some uh, lack of clarity about it. It seems to imply, if I listened well, and maybe I didn't, that if Orange Cross discontinued service, that we could not hire additional paramedics to fill that void. No, it's in there. Thank you, Alderman Manny. Uh, excellent question. The wording in here is uh, states very clearly that this can only be, this uh, can only be altered when and if the geographic service area of the fire department is expanded and then must be approved by a two-thirds majority of the council. In other words, it, the effect is taking uh, a financial proposal for expanded service area and with a two-thirds majority making homework be paramount uh, in such a proposal, um, as well as allowing for us to expand at any time. We could theoretically, the chief could theoretically, if this passes, get calls from three or four municipalities to provide service. We could be in here next month because they've already pre-prepared, it sounds like, many of these figures. Uh, and with a two-thirds majority, because the numbers look good, we do it. So the, the, it does allow for this expansion, like right after a turkey dinner on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Correct. Okay. On the amendment? Well, I guess you on that sentence, then we need to change the word freeze to perhaps um, this, uh, this uh, limit. That'd be fine. Thank Would that be all right? <laughs> Can I read the motion? Uh, let's read the motion, and it'll be a, uh, a vote on the amendment only. Okay, the, correct me if I'm wrong. The motion reads, be it further resolved that beginning January 1, 2008 and ending December 31st, 2012, that the Sheboygan Fire Department's staffing levels be limited not to exceed the current proposed level. This limit can only be altered when and if the geographic service area of the fire department is expanded and then must be approved with a two-thirds affirmative vote of the Common Council. So an aye vote would be to approve that amendment. Please call roll. Uh, Your Honor, if... Alternative McLean. If I could uh, suggest another clarification about the geographic boundaries of the fire department, I think the language is something to that effect. Uh, perhaps if that could be expanded to for ambulance service, so you're not talking about providing fire service. Oh, well, Magisha, you're in agreement with that? I'm, I'm in agreement. If we add the Thank you, Your Honor. If we add the uh, the words ambulance service after fire department in the last sentence, yes. I think that covers it. Okay. Um, President Hanna, friendly amendment? Okay. Okay? Yep. Very good. Please call the roll. Hanna? Aye. Heideman? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Kleunis? Which I don't have my mic on. I'm sorry, I didn't have my mic on. Hanna? Aye. Heideman? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Kleunis? Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? Aye. Wangeman? Aye. Boren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Serta? Aye. And Gisha? Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. Now I need a motion to put the resolution upon its passage as amended. Mayor, I would like to put the 
amended <clears throat> resolution upon his passage. Is there a second? Second. Second. Now we have a discussion, and that brings you back to the original motion, but it has been amended. You can discuss it there. Alderman Ryan, you go first, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I'd like to address pineapple sausage. Uh, I believe that uh, your numbers are probably good on the pineapple sausage, but you may want to do a marketing study and get yourself a focus group to see if it tastes any good. Um, myself, uh, this has been one of the most probably difficult and thankless decisions made by this council since I've been on it. Uh, it's been very contentious. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation out there. It's, it's not been a lot of fun, I don't think, for anybody on this council. But, uh, you know, my, myself, when I decide how to vote on any, on any given decision, I've never read a political how-to book because I figured it, it'll probably corrupt me and cloud my thinking process. So I basically use uh, uh, three factors in, in making decisions. First of all, the, the, the number one uh, hurdle that, that any question has to, has to get across is, is, does it make sense? And this does make sense. It makes sense financially, fiscally it makes sense, logistically it makes sense. Um, I mean, the fire department has brought forth their numbers. Uh, we've had our, our numbers crunchers, our numbers geeks have put them to the test, and they've passed. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's utilizing an asset that the city already has to a greater potential. And uh, that, is, that is a good thing. Um, the second hurdle, the second factor that uh, enters into my decision making is, is it the right thing to do? Do the benefits outweigh the consequences of making this decision? And in this, in this case, the benefits for the taxpayers of Sheboygan do outweigh the consequences. We have to remember that we cannot, we cannot forget that there will be some employee losses at Orange Cross. And those are people, those are taxpayers. Uh, those are people trying to raise families, so we cannot forget about that. Uh, on the other hand, is this going to benefit the taxpayers of Sheboygan, the people that we represent? And the answer is, I believe, yes it is. So that, you know, I, I believe that that is the greater benefit. And, and so that, that passes that test. The, the third factor that I always bring into my decision-making process, and the final factor, is does the public support it? And that's where the problem lies on this one, because we all know on this, the general public, I believe that there's a lot of misinformation out there. I believe that a lot of them are, it's an anti-council uh, anti reaction, an anti-government reaction to say, don't do it. It's a bad thing to do. But regardless, if you take out the people that are influenced by Orange Cross or St. Nicholas or Memorial, if you take them out of the mix, you take out your normal rabble-rousers that are going to give you a comment on every subject that comes up, and we, you know, there's plenty of them out there, it's still opposed by the general public and vehemently opposed by a good portion of them, even though they may not have the proper information. So making a decision is, is very difficult uh, on, this, on this matter. Um, for me, it passes two out of the three hurdles. It doesn't pass three. But regardless, it's a tough decision to make. And no matter what decision we make, uh, we're going to be apologizing to the fire department or to our constituents or to our fellow council members, however it works. It's a very difficult decision, but I believe this council has done the work, has done the homework to make this, this, uh, this decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Alderman Bauk. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, and I'll be really quick because I left a teaching moment undone. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, the propriety of including some of those burdens. It's, it's not never okay to include some of those burdens in there. And now I've just used so many negatives, I've confused everyone. As we consider whether or not to get into this proposal, it is inappropriate to consider the other 14 uh, fire, uh, fire department salaries and things of that nature. We only use the incremental costs, and that's the pineapple squisher and the four people that we'd have to hire. Uh, to, whether we decide 
to get in and whether we evaluate how successful it was. That's all we need to consider. Now, the time when you consider all those other burdens is when you want to compare it. So if I wanted to compare the profitability of pineapple sausage to the profitability of brats in Italian, then it would be appropriate to burden pineapple sausage with all of those costs. And I just wanted to be clear that, uh, because I'm going to hear from my constituents tonight, uh, th am I saying that it's never appropriate to include those financial burdens? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying for the decision of whether we sh or not we should get involved uh, and how we evaluate whether it was successful or not a couple of years from now, that would only involve uh, the costs of the ambulance leases and those four additional hires uh, based on the practice of contribution margin. Thank you, Thank you Alderman Bulk. Next we have Alderman Wangeman. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. 44 years ago, I joined the police department in this city, and I've had a unique opportunity to work with many of the firefighters shoulder to shoulder. I've gotten to know them. I was in the police ambulance myself, so there are on many occasions where I worked with the fire department on extracting people from damaged vehicles, uh, rescues off of rooftops, and you name all the things they did, and my admiration for them is second to none. If Chief Politusky were to ask me right now how I would vote on this and how I feel about it, I would say, I'm going to vote for the fire department, but I don't have that luxury. Everybody in this council chamber is indebted to one thing, and that is to representing your constituents. I can take everything and reduce this complex problem. I had all these papers at home, but the pile on my desk kept getting higher and higher and higher. And I got more confused and more confused, and as I've said before, I may not be the brightest candle on the cake up here. but. Uh, I had trouble analyzing all this. Then the phone started to ring. And for whatever reason, as Alderman Bourne has said, they were 90% against. I have only one obligation as an alderman. And my obligation is to represent my constituents, not my feelings, not the figures that are presented to me, not the proposals that are being made. I reduced it all down to the most common denominator. And that's the representation of my constituents. My constituents tell me no. I had people flag me down on the street. I had people call me. These weren't people from Orange Cross. They weren't people from the hospitals. They were people I knew, friends of mine. I'm thoroughly convinced, as Alderman Ryan said, the bulk of the people in this community don't want this. We've been accused of not listening, not listening to the people. We have to listen to them, because if we don't, they will be heard. If they're not going to be heard tonight in this chamber, they'll be heard in the voting poll. And we might just be making a great big mistake there if we rule that out. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Wangeman. We have next uh, Alderman Vanderbilt. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll make this short. Uh, to, to Alderman Ryan, this is a thankless and difficult job. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> and, and uh, Alderman Sir and Alderman Balk, I absolutely 100% agree with, with each of them. And I just want to say when it comes down to it, it comes down to a one common sense question, and that is, can the fire department provide the same level of service as the Orange Cross and make a profit at it? And after three weeks of looking at the numbers, after almost three hours of debate, the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Vanderweel. Next we have Alderman Tigers. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I've been a kind of on the fringe of this for a long time. Um, with all respect to you, I regret being compared, my care being compared to pineapple sausage. I feel as if health care is very important, and for us to compare it to widgets and production is not where we're at. And I'm glad tonight that we did talk about patient care more than we have before. It's been a lot of numbers up to this point. Patient care has come up tonight in a significant way. But I still feel as if patient care is the most important thing, and I feel as if we're going to split this emergency services, and some of it will be 911, some of it will be going back and forth through nursing homes or to hospitals and out of the area. We will have two crews not getting the experience that they need to do a good job. They will both be on the job half the time, getting half the experience, getting half the expertise. And I'm sorry, but I believe this is a patient care issue. The city is going into health care in a serious way, and I'm not sure we're ready for that. And I, I speak that from my heart. And I believe this before I got one call at my house. I believe this before I got one call or one email. 
and I've not changed my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Montanus. Next we have Alderman Verhassel. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Again, this is a very tough decision for me as well. Obviously, I've, I asked to put the three-man hold on this a week or so ago because I wanted more information. I wanted more discussion, much like we had tonight. And I think it's been great so far. We've been here coming up on three hours, but I think it's been great, balanced discussion. Um, in the last 14 days, I've received between 110 and 120 phone calls slash email slash knocks on my door. And I've never received knocks on my door since I've been an alderman. Uh, and again, there's some of the, you can say, the immediate response I hear from some people is, well, they're Orange Cross, Aurora, St. Nick's personnel. That's who's calling me. But I can tell you, having been fresh off the campaign trail for three and a half months, I know a lot of these people who are calling me. These are people who may or may not have used the ambulance service, but they're, they're your everyday person. So I do put some merit in, in those percentages and those numbers of contacts that I've received. Now, I do also see the merits of better utilizing our fire department personnel. Um, but again, I also see the potential liability that could arise years down the road, whether it be two, three, five years down the road, if this thing does not go as we projected well. And, I, and I'm having trouble putting that potential liability on our taxpayers who are already known to be some of the highest taxed in the state of Wisconsin. Again, on the, I can't believe I'm saying the word pineapple squisher publicly without the presence of my three- and one-year-old in the room, but I'll say it. Uh, I think there's some flaws in the financial analyses as we look at the fire department personnel here because it assumes that those personnel costs are fixed and that we can do nothing about them. If we assume that those personnel costs are fixed, that's an absolutely true statement, but if we feel like a number of my constituents have called have started to question if we can give up the equivalent of 14 personnel towards the ambulance service, should we be talking about staffing levels? And I'm not proposing that because I'm not prepared, nor am I educated on the department staffing levels as it compares to public safety and everything at this point in time. But I'm relaying what some of my constituents have shared with me. So I think there's some flaws in how we're analyzing this. I think we need to put some portion of those 14, 15 people towards the cost of running this ambulance service because they cannot and will not run without the help whether it's 20%, 30%, 50% of those 14 people's time, this ambulance service cannot run. So I think to be true to ourselves, if we want to know if we're truly seeing a profit for the manpower we're putting behind it, I think we have to look at some portion of that. And I think it's you're looking at a level of four new people plus some percentage of the remaining 14%. And I, I rely on Commander Herman Butler and Chief Listusky to provide that percentage to me. But if we do go ahead with this tonight, I would just ask that we set up this cost center very effectively so that we can truly monitor and give ourselves an honest answer at the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Alan Russell. Uh, Vice President Bourne. <clears throat> Thank you, Renner. This has been a tough one for me, too, but uh, it's, it's come down to uh, what Alderman Wangaman said. Uh, when I ran for Alderman in the 4th District uh, last year, uh, I heard loud and clear that the citizens of the 4th District were not being represented represented by the incumbent, uh, and, I, and I made a vow when I ran for office that I was going to represent the people in the 4th District, and they've said loud and clear that they don't want this. I have the utmost respect for Chief Lestusky. I think he's doing an outstanding job. I've known Deputy Chief Sharp for 24 years. He used to be my neighbor. When he retires from the fire department, he's going to be a tremendous loss to the department. I've supported the fire department uh, earlier or late last year with saving two positions on the fire department where there was potential layoffs through creative financing uh, on the part of the chief and the finance department or finance committee. We were able to keep those positions. I'm sorry I can't support you on this one, but going forward, as long as I'm alderman, I will take it on an issue by issue basis and I will support you whenever possible. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman, uh, Vice President Boren. Alderman Ryan. Thank you once again, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do agree with Alderperson Klein. This is, this is a health care issue. It is not just a numbers game. Um, something happened to me last week that that you know I have taken that into my my into account. I was in Newsburg at a, a gas station I have down there, and. The, there were two, two ladies on duty, one of them being elderly, elderly, I shouldn't say elderly, in her late 60s. And uh, 
I came in and I said good morning in my own cheery way, the way I always do, and uh, I didn't get any response from either of them, so I'm thinking, well, what happened here? Obviously, you know, they're mad at me about something again. I didn't think I had done anything wrong. Well, it turned out one of them wasn't feeling well. She was sitting on the chair, and, and as I talked to her, I said, what's going on? And, and uh, after a couple minutes, she was just not responding. Her eyes were open, her tongue was sticking out, and uh, we called, uh, I told the, the other lady on duty, I said, dial 911 right now. And she did, and Oostburg Ambulance showed up, and they showed up in about, it, it should seem like a lifetime, I bet you it was two minutes, and they were there. And uh, by that time, I had laid her down on the floor, and she did come back too, luckily, because I thought she was dead, and I wasn't very good with that. Um, but it is a health care issue, and, and the, the, the professionalism of, of this company, which is a uh, volunteer uh, ambulance service, I believe. It won't be affected by our decision here no matter what. Um, they came in, they knew her, uh, she was comfortable, everybody was comfortable. So people aren't comfortable with change is what I'm saying. She went to the hospital, spent a couple days there, luckily she was okay and she's back home now. Um, people are not comfortable with change and it is a health care issue. Uh, the question is can our fire department provide that level of service that Oostburg Ambulance did in that case? Um, I believe they can. Are people going to be comfortable with that change, especially those people that have used Orange Cross, that I'm sure are as comfortable with Orange Cross as this person was with Oostburg Ambulance? Of course not. They're not going to want that change. They don't want it because it's change. It's something they're comfortable with if they've used that service, and, and that is a big, big factor of why there is opposition out there to this subject also. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Two more, Alderman Bulk. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Just to be clear, I just want to, in deference to the uh, older person from District 5, the first words out of my mouth tonight were, uh, without equivalent patient care, we have no reason to be here chatting. And then I asked the doctor uh, from Orange Cross and then also the fire chief to, to establish, uh, you know, that there would be a same standard of care, improved standard of care, and, and they both acknowledge that. So I just want to be clear that it's about standard of care for me too. Orange Cross. Uh, cared for my father in the last couple of weeks of his life, and uh, I would trust that same mission to the Sheboygan Fire Department. Thank you, Alderman Bulk. Uh, Alderman Kittleson. Thank you, Your Honor. I guess listening to everybody speak, I, I just have to say that um, I feel if our firefighters didn't feel 100% sure that they could provide the citizens of our city uh, with this ambulance service, they wouldn't be pursuing it. And I also feel that if our firefighters didn't feel they could do it in a cost-effective manner, they wouldn't be pursuing it. Um, as our former fire chief, Mark Zeyer, said to us a few weeks ago, there's really nothing more in it for them than a lot of hard work. And I feel that if they didn't feel that they were going to be successful at it, they wouldn't want to be taking this on. And so uh, standing on the words of the resolution, that the Sheboygan Fire Department shall place in service paramedic ambulances which shall be dedicated to the city of the Sheboygan residents in order to provide the same or better level of services previously provided and that the Sheboygan Fire Department as a guarantee to the Common Council and the taxpayer agree that any losses incurred in any given budget year shall be deducted from their general operating budget uh, in the following budget year without disagreement or recourse to the mayor or the common council. I feel with such a guarantee in place, the only way is to move forward with this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Kittleson. There are no more lights. I will ask one more time. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Please call the roll. And this will be on the resolution as amended. Resolution as amended for the fire department to start providing the services to the city of Sheboygan. And I supports the proposition by the fire department. A no does not. Heideman. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Clyunas. No. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Ryan. No. Vanderweel. Aye. For Hasselt. No. Wangaman. Boren? No. Bauk? Aye. Serta? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Aye. 
11 ayes, 5 noes. Motion carries. Item 4104 and RC, by, uh, RC number 360708 by the Committee of the Whole to whom was referred resolution number 140708 by Old Person Hannah authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 07 budget. President Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I would move the report of committee uh, be accepted and adopted, and that is RC uh, 360708. Motion to accept and adopt and put the resolution upon its passage. Put the resolution is there a second? upon its passage. Second. Under discussion, we have Vice President Bourne. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, just for clarification, are we voting on the $500,000 plus the $200,000 and the $100,000? Is that what we're voting on? That's what's been uh, referred to this. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, at the committee of the whole meeting, uh, I believe it was decided or was given strong consideration that uh, rather than buying ambulances, the ambulances was going to be leased, and I believe it was seventy-eight was it seventy-eight thousand dollars a year for the lease, and that would not be payable until two thousand and eight, and that would be able to come out of revenue out of the revenue stream of the new ambulance business. So, I see no reason to proceed. Uh, with allocating the $500,000 for ambulances if indeed it's going to be able to be paid for out of the revenue stream uh, of the new ambulance service. Uh, somebody would like to comment on that. I, 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 we, were, we were talking at the committee, the whole meeting, we were talking about amending this, so I wanted to find out if we can still amend this. Well, you can, the, and, and the motion would be to amend uh, the... Uh the resolution to reflect only three hundred thousand dollars and to strike the five hundred thousand dollars from the motor second. vehicle. Did you make that motion, though? So moved. Motion and second. Under discussion on the amendment only. I'm going to turn everybody off. Hold on. Please, please bear with me. Turn everybody off. Who wants to speak on the amendment? Alman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. If we go ahead with the amendment. That would mean that we've already made the decision to lease and not purchase, correct? Pretty much. Thank you. Which, again, could be revisited by finance at some Thank point. You. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Your Honor. It was my understanding that uh, finance was going to look at leasing these vehicles. I think uh, at this point uh, it's a lot more uh, palatable to the taxpayer to not appropriate $500,000 up front when we don't need to. So I would like somebody from finance to speak on this. Have we looked into the feasibility of the lease, and can it be paid at the end of that fiscal year? That, that's why the, uh, the motion is to strike the $500,000. If at some point it needs to be revisited, finance committee can do that. So the motion is to strike? To strike the $500,000. Under discussion on the amendment. Alderman Gisha. I just wanted to comment on the lease option. You're absolutely correct. We tried to amend that earlier in a... In an attempt, um, the, the the question about the 500 is accurate. The the proposal for the fire department has the lease amount in it. The only question finance will have to deal with is whether that payment is in advance or in arrears. It can be set up in many different ways, um, and uh, so by striking it, it doesn't stop us. But do we need authorization to enter into a lease at this time? Strike the 500. Can we do that at a later date? Later date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the amendment only. Strike 500000 leave $300,000. Please call the roll. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunas? No. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? Aye. Wangaman? No. Boren? No. Bauk? Aye. Serta? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. And Heidemann? Aye. Thirteen eyes, three noes. Motion carries. Now I need a motion to uh, put the resolution upon its passage as amended. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> I would put the motion upon its passage as amended. Second. Motion second. Under discussion, as amended. There being none, please call the roll. Hold on, excuse me. Sorry, Your Honor. I just wanted uh, after these are startup costs. These three hundred thousand dollars, as I understand, were startup costs, so we can begin uh, getting into this. W will that three hundred thousand dollars be returned to the general coffers once the business is up and that was, running? That was the understanding. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alderman Bolt. Anybody else? There is none. Please call the roll. Clionis? No. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? Aye. Wangeman? No. Boren? No. Bauk? Aye. Serta? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Ann Kittleson? Aye. Thirteen ayes, three noes. Motion carries. Any motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. 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 Aye.